Yes, go, go, go. You can go ahead. Uh, can we ask our, uh, okay. Uh, Ramdas sir and uh, Sundramuth sir, are you okay? We can start. Okay, Gokul. Uh, Balamuran, can you unmute the both of them? Okay, Gokul. Gokul, you need to manage uh, the things. Uh, you need to unmute uh, uh, whoever want to speak and uh, then you can go ahead and introduce them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, all are uh, okay. Unmute only. Okay, fine then. You can just proceed. But Sundramud, sir, I'm getting it is unmute, but uh, he's on mute. No, no, uh, both of them are trying at the simultaneously. So you just uh, try it once. Uh, you have done it. Okay. Okay. I think, okay. Maybe we will initiate. Ah, yes. Uh, but my screen, I'm seeing uh, still uh, uh, Dr. Pillai's presentation material. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is It is there, sir. So uh, fine. You can, uh, fine. Okay. No problem. No problem. See, I just wanted to make the confirmation. No, you can You can change the view, sir. You can change the view in the top right corner. So you can uh, change, uh, change the view to gallery view. So that you can also see the people on the right hand side. So all the people would be uh, in the scroll down box. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm yes, seeing. Sir. Okay. Uh, Great. I think uh, we shall start with the uh, now, I think IEA and IEA chairmen are there and vice presidents are there. So definitely, I think Bala, you can stream on YouTube. So we can uh, initiate this. Yes, yes. It's, already, it's already live, Gokul. So you can just Thank go you. ahead and uh, uh, make your presentation. Yes. Gokul. Can you Thank hear you. me? My yes, audio yes. Is perfect. Thank you. It's perfect. You so, can just go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, very good morning to all present here. So it's an immense pleasure to invite all of our uh, uh, eminent speakers as well as the panelists and our uh, delegates who are watching inside the Zoom as well as in YouTube. So it's an immense like, morning on Saturday 30th, May 2020, the first time the lockdown period, we are organizing an international online conference on the challenges and opportunity in aeronautics, astronautics, and aviation. It has been organized by Institute of Engineers, Tamil Nadu State Center, along with Institute of Aeronautics, Astronautics, and Aviation. We are so happy. I think we have come to a challenge of the past 10 days to achieve this conference. We are humbly happy to receive our uh, Batma Bhushan, Dr. A. Sivadana Pillai, sir. Also, Batma Sri, Dr. R. M. Vasagam, sir, who is going to join very shortly. So definitely, I think uh, without uh, uh, saying this quote of Abdul Kalam, as a young citizen of India, armed with technology, knowledge, and love for my nation, I realize a small aim is a crime. I will work and sweat for a great vision, the vision of transforming India into a developed nation powered by economic strength with value system. I am one of the citizens of billion. Only vision will ignite the billion souls. I has entered into me. It has entered into me. The ignited soul, compared to any resource, is the most powerful source on the earth, above the earth and under the earth. It's a quote given by our Bharat Ratana, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. With that, I initiate this conference to be proceeded. So we welcome all our uh, speakers, panelists, eminent guests, as well as the delegates for this conference. It is my immense pleasure that I am Gokul and the convener of this conference to ask this program. So I would like to bring our chairman IEA, Dr. Engineer R. Ramadas, who is also like a, a very dynamic person who has given a, a lots of freedom to organize this conference from IEA Tamil Nadu State Center. And Ramadas, Engineer Ramadas is a chairman for IEA for past two years before he was an honorary secretary. So he holds a mechanical and production department and he, ha he is holding a CEO of a startup company. So I would like to invite our engineer R. Ramadas to deliver his welcome on. So please. Chief of Institution of Engineers, Tamil Nadu State Center. So your voice is low. On behalf of Institution of Engineers India, Tamil Nadu State Center, I welcome today our uh, Chief Guest, Dr. A. Sivadana Pillai, sir, and then our uh, Dr. Aram Vasam, sir, and other uh, Sundramurthy, Vice President of IAAA, and then Karnakaran, and then uh, Praveen, sir, 
and uh, other uh, dignitaries uh, in that uh, uh, first kind of uh, online international conference in the topic of challenge and an opportunities in aeros aeronautics aero astronautics and aviation the ia the institution of engineers india it's a 100 years old body it started in 1920 in chennai and then later it's moved to the kolkata it's a headquarters now the headquarters is kolkata now we are entering into the centenary year uh, 100th year uh, la last year uh, september 13 we started the 100 year celebration in chennai this year we are going to conclude in the kolkata for the centenary year uh, celebrations uh, the and other uh, ia have uh, 15 division that is all inclusive of uh, right from uh, aerospace to textile engineering in uh, one uh, one number la and then we are uh, doing regularly we are doing the online uh, the, this type of uh, conference in uh, uh, physically in one of the city or uh, any one of the cities this is the first kind of uh, online uh, international conference and then uh, we have uh, tie up with springer journals we are releasing that uh, series a b c d that five series uh, book regularly the tie up with the springer journals and then uh, we are doing regularly that uh, one day seminar and two day seminars and uh, international conference and then apart from that every year we have uh, one national convention in the each division that is 15 division 15 division have a national convention any one of the city any one of the our local center is hosted uh, actually we have uh, 124 centers in throughout india uh, and then uh, six uh, foreign uh, dubai abu dhabi and uh, uh, nepal and uh, other countries six uh, uh, other countries also we have the centers in 32 all the state center also have uh, uh, 32 uh, state centers in tamil nadu state center uh, it's uh, it's around uh, 1922 it started now uh, i think uh, next year two years uh, we are going to uh, celebrate that uh, centenary year uh, in under uh, tamil nadu state center we have 16 local centers here, uh, only one center have more than uh, 15 centers. That is uh, 16 local center in one, say, one state. Uh, next one is uh, Bombay. Around 10 center is there. So uh, apart from that, we have uh, different uh, kind of, uh, that is institutional members, uh, uh, colleges and uh, suppose uh, companies, uh, all the, they are the member in the institution of engineers. Totally 540 members in the institutional member in uh, institution of engineers. Now, more than 100, uh, 110 uh, institutional member from the Tamil Nadu state center it's alone. Uh, all the way, uh, only the membership, it's a uh, second position. And then uh, uh, rest of the things, everything, the Tamil Nadu state center is the uh, top of uh, everything. Uh, 2017, we uh, celebrated... Uh, Indian Engineering Congress hosted by Tamil Nadu State Center. That time, uh, President of India, uh, Excellency uh, <coughs> Govind uh, is participated in the validity function. The last year, we celebrated the centenary inauguration center. The governor of Tamil Nadu is participated. Like that, many of part of the programs we are regularly we are conducting. This, I, once again, I uh, welcoming all the dignitaries uh, in that uh, international conference. Once again, I welcome everybody. Thank you, one and all, Mr. Gokul. Now take over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your warm welcome address. So it's an immense pleasure to initiate this conference with your welcome address from our IEA chairman. Uh, I would like to invite our uh, uh, Dr. Sudramuthi, sir, who is a uh, vice uh, president of uh, IAA, which is an institute of aeronautics, astronautics, and aviation. And he also was working in, in, uh, as an uh, eminent scientist in ISRO. And he holds lots of position and he contributes various activities in the aerospace industry. May I invite our uh, TK Sundaramuthi, sir, to deliver about the conference 
and why we have initiated an objective of conference sir please good morning everybody uh, especially uh, dr uh, shivadan pillai and our uh, walking uh, encyclopedia of our uh, space uh, dr vasagam and then pandian and uh, okay dr ramdas sir balamurugan gokul karnagaran everyone i think uh, what <coughs> we have done in a very short interval of time i think it is not even uh, okay uh, three weeks uh, efforts uh, it has now culminated into this uh, uh, program of uh, what we are going to see post uh, of this uh, lockdown period prior to that i just wanted to tell uh, how we had the idea of forming a association for this uh, we when we were thinking of an idea of making a uh, kind of an association for uh, aeronautics astronautics and the avionics we were grooming this uh, for the past 5 years finally it has culminated in 2017 we have formed the association and then from then on we were doing a lot of uh, activities in the colleges uh, promoting this aero modeling as well as uh, promoting the aerospace activities and that kind of a things and then lot of lecture programs we have arranged a lot of demo programs we have done and in fact in one of the program where we have done our uh, uh, bottle rocket uh, competition for all the engineering students i think uh, our uh, competition got entered into the india book so that is one great thing which we have done uh, two years back uh, and the activity is what we are going to do so is mainly we wanted to make a niche in the aerospace field like what people have done in automobile that was the main from that automobile thing only we have got the inspiration and then we started this aerospace uh, we wanted to promote now presently what we are is uh, already there are lot of uh, opportunities and avenues are available for us especially in the uh, aerospace domain because you people are already seeing in the uh days to come i think what in uh, 2000s what it boom has taken place similar to that we are expecting a aerospace boom uh, in the coming days so what we thought was it is a very apt thing to have this conference of uh, uh, aerospace in defense sector i think this is the first time uh, probably in the past uh, uh decad what we can see is that one great change has taken place in defense sector now it has been allowed to have private participation as well as in the uh aircraft industry and then now a lot of academic institutions are also coming into the picture so we mainly divided this into three panels of uh, uh eminent speakers like pandian and all are going to be there Uh, they are going to discuss about uh, mainly on uh, defense side one panel and then uh, aero on another uh, panel and then academia how we are going to support it these three panels are going to be supported so with this i think for all the speakers uh, and uh, they have voluntarily agreed and then with the though so with so much of difficulties they have agreed to participate in this and then share their knowledge yes and then with this uh, we hope this will be of immense use to the students community i once again welcome all of you thank you so much yes so well, thank you so much sir for your uh, uh, over briefing about our conference and uh, why we are doing it the objective also the panelists so we we, are, we thank uh, your presence as well as delivery as a part of iia so without waiting much more time i think uh, we have our eminent chief guest i think we are immense pleasure to invite him uh, which is none other than our dr a swadana pillai sir who is a batma bhushan and batma sri but definitely i think uh, india like a nation 
our uh, pillai sir is one of the key uh, person and uh, along with salam sir he has worked a lot uh, definitely we are so happy sir so much delighted for your presence as well as uh, uh, such a uh, time you have given uh, for this conference and definitely i think uh, the participants uh, delegates who are watching inside and outside they are very much uh, delighted to see you at this forum so before we uh, take up our inaugural address uh, by our uh, chief guest so let me introduce our chief guest in a short brief uh, dr a shivadanu pillai sir is an indian scientist who formerly served as an honorary distinguished professor at indian space research organization and an honorary professor at iit delhi in the department of mechanical engineering and a visiting professor at indian institute of science he is a president of project management associate and he is the former chairperson of board of governors of national institute of technology gurukshetra he was a formerly served as the chief controller of research and development from the year 1996 to 2014 and held in the rank of distinguished scientist from the year 1999 to 2014 at the defense research development organization as the minister of defense of the republic of india he is also founder ceo and managing director of brahmos aerospace private limited he has received so many awards that is like padma uh, uh, bhushan and padma shri which itself like applaud him that is uh, 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 a biggest achievement for our nation and uh, he also served his initial career in isro for a period of 20 years so we are so proud at uh, his presence in isro as well as in defense and in brahmos is a very close friend of dr abdul kalam sir so both of them has defined lots of projects for our nation and uh, i am so proud sir in inviting you for this conference i think uh, our uh, team of uh, iea and it play is uh, immense pleasure in inviting you so i would like to invite our shivadana pillai sir to take up this session sir please good morning to all of you first of all let me wish you good health in this difficult time i am uh, thankful to mr gogol for uh, putting me into the uh, conference uh, because he was uh, he is a close friend of mine so vasagam is here to join he is a very highly respected person uh, i am the organizers of uh, the institute of uh, aeronautics astronautics and aviation and the vice president uh, dr tk sundaramurthy then the iei um, tnc president ramdas who is known to me because we have got a mou signed with him for joint conferences from the project management associates so we work together so one all other good speakers who are going to be there in the panel uh, then uh, students teachers friends from uh, various parts of the world for all of you my greetings now you see that uh, this is a very important topic you have chosen the challenges in the right time it is whatever problem we have is going to be there for a few more months but i think that man cannot be defeated we will come back and whatever lost will be compensated so our future is going to be good particularly in the aeronautics astronautics the space and the aviation so please be sure please be confident that we are having a great future i would like to show you some slides um to highlight you okay not moving Ah, yes, I'm just showing to you a video of Carl Sagan. That's home. That's us. Very On funny. it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there. on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam the earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena 
think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner how frequent their misunderstandings how eager they are to kill one another how fervent their hatreds our posturings our imagined self-importance the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark in our obscurity in all this vastness there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves the earth is the only world known so far to harbor life there is nowhere else at least in the near future to which our species could migrate visit yes settle not yet like it or not for the moment the earth is where we make our stand it has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image to me it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot the only home we've ever known was it clear to you the sawal yes, audio sir. everything is clear yeah very clear sir okay now let us see that uh, see people uh, think small what the just now the google introduced dr kalam's uh, slogan that small aim is a crime see a great person like kelvin the president of the royal society declared that man cannot fly right brothers proved he is wrong within 86 to 93 within 10 years they proved kelvin was wrong same time in 1896 another man came konstantin cholsky from russia he says what can be more fantastic than to land on the surface of the mars a new great era will begin in astronomy from the moment using rocket devices the rocket was not known at that time but he is envisioning that man will land on mars of course man has landed on the moon but there's a there's a definitely we will be seeing in another 10 years time the human being will go to the mars so we have done lot of work in the area aeronautics we have done lca is operational we are now getting into mca is a big program which is coming up and we have got lot of helicopters and dark helicopters has come recently so we we have got good done good work in aeronautics but lot of things to be uh, done the if you look at the space of course we have done wonderful we are the fourth in the world in the space faring countries today remarkably we have done our isro has done a great job and the chandrayaan 2 just missed but the effort was great and the missile area if you see that is another uh, aerospace area where we have done well we have got a strategic systems available agni with 5000 kilometers with nuclear payload so we also got a supersonic cruise missile brahmos which is the fastest in the world in the cruise missile category and uh, it's a, a we are number 1 in the world so there are many things we have done in the aeronautics astronautics and the aviation and we are now looking on to the planets as well as to new area called hypersonic plane so i will talk to you about that in in short time now space uh, we have we are self friend in space technology uh, we are now supporting the Uh, launching of uh, various countries satellites more than 250 uh, 
foreign satellites have been launched by isro so the, the thing is that we are cost effective and we are highly reliable today pslv stands number 1 in the world in terms of reliability of launch and the lowest premium in the world so we have got a good opportunity to go in a big way in the space program and in the marketing and then you see we look at now uh, the new technologies like nuclear propulsion because we want to move fast 9 months is a too long a time to go to mars so we want to do it by using the nuclear propulsion it will take 3 months to reach but still there's a program launched by nasa that 39 days for mars this is going to be exciting in the in terms of technology second thing is lunar exploration the lunar exploration is necessary because the moon has got exotic materials so we want to explore that then other plus the like uh, mars has got a very good opportunity as uh, people say that mars there is a living opportunity in mars once mars was a green like uh, uh, earth 1 billion years before they have retraced back nasa to say that mars was a beautiful planet 1 billion years before got dried up no water now but you can see the trace of all these developments in the mars uh, by the analysis so we are going for a lunar exploration uh, first thing is to put the man uh, in the space so the people have been selected now they are undergoing training in um, russia so two of the first one my person will go and then number of people will go in the orbital vehicle to the space and come back that will uh, you know soon uh, uh, further into the landing on the moon finally establishing a factory from 2025 onwards we will be seeing lot of activities on the moon so for the, from us russia and china we may join them later but we have to go in a long way to reach that point and our people uh, isro is capable of doing that so why we are interested on the moon two things one is moon is a good launch pad for future launches being gravity being less uh, less 1/6 of the earth it is giving an opportunity to have a smaller vehicle compared to that what we have uh, for the on the earth so that is one thing that launch pad for going to mars or other planets or exploring the um, uh, no uh, asteroids and other uh, far, far off planets including the moons of saturn there is a moon called uh, titan which is believed to have uh, uh, believed to have a uh, living conditions so the, we have to explore that second important thing is the lunar dust has got a very interesting material called ranolith ragolith this ragolith processed will give helium 3 helium 3 is a non radioactive material for generating nuclear energy by fusion so the helium 3 if we can be processed on the moon through this robotic system what has been shown here and then brought to the earth and then using the fusion technology reactor we will be able to generate energy 1 gram of uh, helium 3 is equal to 100 grams 100 times uh, better than uh, uranium and it is non radioactive so it is going to be a big boon for generating energy for the whole world so how do you generate energy out of the helium 3 so that that's why we are joined with other nations or seven nations have joined under a program called iter international thermo nuclear experimental reactor built being built at france uh, we have joined as a 10% partner into that and uh, the whole cryostat that big structure what you are seeing is being built by us half already assembled this reactor is going to come to generate 500 megawatt of power uh, using the fusion technology this is our learning ground or oh, each country has got is their own tokamak they have done lot of trials but this is going to uh, be a joint program to share knowledge on the fusion technology 
because fusion technology is the future compared to the fission, which is generating a lot of radioactivity. So this is the reactor, what you are saying, and the partners, you see seven partners who are contributing for, the, uh, for uh, making this reactor. 2025 is the target date for the reactor to be ready. So by 2030, India will be having the fusion reactor. 2030, we will be able to bring helium-3, and then we will be processing. So you will see from 2030 to 2040, there's going to be a new um, way of generating energy linking with um, moon. Then comes Mars. We have done the Mars uh, mission. Our satellite has done well. Um, it has uh, lived long. And we are having a lot of data which has come. I uh, was giving clue of the, what is, is there in Mars. And NASA has published a lot of data on Mars. So putting together, there is a possibility of man landing on the Mars uh, in the near future. So there are a lot of technologies to be proved for the human being to go to the Mon, uh, to the Mars. One is the nuclear thermal energy to take us in three months time. Then uh, refueling uh, technology to be introduced, multi-mission space exploration vehicle with the uh, suit probes, laser communication, additive manual. You can make things on the move that while you are traveling in this uh, vehicle to the space, you can make your own products in space. So 3D man printing is coming into the space manufacturing. Then finally, is um, um, landing on the Mars. And NASA has a big program. This what I have put is the NASA program where they are uh, trying to uh, go for um, a good system. Uh, Elon Musk is working on that. The idea is 2030. Uh, the uh, man will land on Mars. This is the goal they have, and it's going to be a very interesting thing to uh, uh, so see the progress. So uh, overall, if you see the space uh, uh, space program wise, we are energizing competitiveness now. We are in the global market. We are uh, ISRO is uh, forming out um, uh, a fantastic organization which will be uh, integrating the industries and we will make space industry complex. Then the R&D is going to be in the new dimension is going to come for manned mission, new propulsion technology, getting into hypersonic, electric propulsion, plasma propulsion, laser communication, laser propulsion, new materials, because we are going to deal with high temperature, new guidance and control simulation. All these technologies are going to come. Uh, we will have the, we will also support the space program will support the national security is also very important joining with DRDO. So the international cooperation will also increase because we are talking about human space flight and joint research on the moon. So the countries, um, India, uh, US, uh, um, Russia, they're all joining together. Japan is also in the, uh, in the loop. France is coming. So all these countries except China, we will be joining together to do research um, on the um, uh, moon and other planets. Possibly later, cooperation in lunar factory, then international space station, removal of space debris, fueling and repair of spacecraft in the orbit to extend its life, solar power satellite, then exploration of helium-3 on moon, asteroids, Mars. So this is going to be a very interesting future we are going to see in another 20 years time, our space program will be on the top. So the when you have all these assets in space, we need to protect the assets. The enemy should not attack us from his satellite. So we have developed the anti-satellite system to protect us uh, from any possible attack. Then we want to generate more energy and also water from outer space. This is one new concept which is being worked out how to generate water from air. And also you can uh, desalinate using the solar energy pumped into a um, uh, floating uh, power station on the ocean and purify the water and pump it to the people for drinking purpose. Then integrated global space station with the core competences of space faring countries. Because now nation, one nation cannot do a big program. It's a very, uh, it's costly 
we want to have cost effective program the nations have to join like minded nations will definitely join then global human resource cadre has to be built because there is a need for uh, people of uh, high caliber in the space research more than what we have in isro so there is going to be a joint program with other countries to develop the uh, human resource cadre uh, in the whole world so that we will be able to share technology work together and for a common mission so we also got in the aerospace area we have got agni program we have 5000 kilometers and we are now working on the mirv which will give the multiple injection reentry warheads so we are going to be very powerful nation with the nuclear payload we are a nuclear power nuclear power state already we have a nuclear weapon state already declared and we have got the carriers for 5000 plus kilometers so it's going to be a big thing of protecting our nation strength respect strength that's what dr kalam used to say so we have to show to the other nations we are not only technology people we also can save our country we are strong people so the internationally we can collaborate so in the aerospace program one novel mission was the brahmos is a joint venture between india and russia you know that when 1971 war we had to use russian anti ship missile to finish off the pakistan uh, uh, ship uh, naval ship now we have got our own anti ship missiles very powerful three times faster than air so we have a very good system and we have went for a novel joint venture where india contributed 50.5% and uh, the russia contributed 49.5% the idea of 50.5 is to make government funding a private company the jv which has been formed for joint design development manufacture and marketing that's called mind to market distributing the uh, the resources already available technology resources between india and russia finally worked as a joint venture company a private company and we were able to do the project within the cost within the time multiple versions have come now all three services have got uh, recently we have flown from the air so all platforms everywhere you will see now the uh, uh, brahmos getting into the ship uh, then land air everywhere it is there so it is a very uh, important and successful program and there is no equivalent to that in the whole world we are the only one to have in the army and in the air only russia has got on ship we also have got so we are the people leading now in the supersonic cruise missile program in the whole world then now we have formed a team already a project is there with us to develop the hypersonic because the hypersonic is a Uh, you know when we have the promos we cannot celebrate it for long the uh, interception will happen so that is why we have to get into the higher speed mark 7 from 3 to 7 we are now venturing into and this is a good program and we have got our gods have got weapons you know you see that lord krishna is having a sudarshan chakra so we are thinking that this missile which is going in hypersonic speed can be operated from the mind of the uh, leader and it can go do its job and come back to us that's the type of concept we are working on that so that a new sudarshan chakra will come because brahmastra we have done now we are working on the sudarshan chakra so hypersonics what it will do terrific we see hypersonic missiles the way it can devast the enemy's area it will penetrate into the nuclear installations of the enemy so that is the power it has got so we are getting into that and uh, we have launched a big program in indian school of science uh, dr kalam inaugurated this hypersonic uh, uh, laboratory which is um, funded from the brahmos and um, it's a, it's a is a very important uh, development which has happened and we are also having another program uh, funded by drdo now 
130 crore funding for hypersonic program uh, to be undertaken in IIT Madras. That's why I'm there in IIT Madras. And then IIT Bombay and um, the IAC jointly, they will be developing all the technologies and DRDL will make a missile. You can see that uh, these are the technologies which, is, which are going to be done. Mainly main technology is the material. High temperature material, we are now working on that. This, if you succeed, all other technologies we have captured. Scramjet engine and high temperature materials. This ISRO has done the scramjet technology already in a small rocket. They have made it and they have flown this scramjet. They achieved 6.5 Mach number uh, for 26 seconds. They have flown. It is a marvelous um, uh, development which has been happened in our country. See, this is the missile which is going to come up. It's uh, going to be, this is the what I showed you, the uh, terminal phase as a hypersonic going and finishing off the enemy for a long distance. It will be for a long range and uh, it is going to be a, one of the very important projects which will be undertaken uh, by us. So the, all over the world, though they, uh, they could not overtake in supersonic, they are trying to overtake in hypersonic. So there's a big program going on. I have seen what Russians have done. China has uh, launched the hypersonic uh, uh, missile, the wave radar. USA has launched the wave radar. So it is not only the wave radar, the major technology is the scramjet technology, which needs to be developed. No one has done it. They are all in the beginning stage for a smaller time, but we want 2,000, 5,000 seconds burning of the scramjet technology that no one has done. So we are now trying to uh, work on that. Mainly it comes to the materials. So if you can um, look at the overall in the aerospace area, we see all these people, they have gone for heavy launch vehicle to put a small payload. Space shuttle, which is uh, 2000 tons in the car, um, this shuttle weight, it can put only 1.5% uh, of the payload. That is, you can put only 30 tons. So it's not a good system. So we thought we formed a team to work uh, um, uh, payload fraction of 15. From 1.5, we want to jump to 15%. It's a very huge, uh, tall order, but we have found the method of doing it with 100 ton takeoff. Our uh, vehicle, which has been designed, can uh, go to the uh, uh, go and orbit around the Earth, spending the fuel, reduce the weight to 91 tons. And while it is flying around the, while it is going around the Earth in a scramjet mode, it doesn't leave the air. The hot air is cooled. There's a heat exchanger. It will cool the air and separate the liquid oxygen and store liquid oxygen. The weight suddenly from 91 ton increased to 166 ton. And then we use cryogenic propulsion because we have got uh, hydrogen stored and we use the liquid oxygen generated in flight. And finally, we are able to put 16 ton in the orbit to that. This is a shock to the world. When we presented in the IAF Congress, uh, it was a very shock. So they said that this is not possible. Finally, we proved now many people are working on this uh, technology, uh, which if it comes, uh, we can get high payload fraction. Why we need high payload fraction? Because we want to see the cost of uh, launch should be reduced. The very, very important thing is the cost. If we are pay spending now, $20,000 per kg of uh, uh, satellites. We want to make it $2,000 initially and finally getting into $200 per kg. This needs technology. So that is what is shown here in this slide. What are the different technologies which can help us to reduce the uh, cost per kg? So we will be successful if we can reduce the cost so that because it's a competitive world. Also the solar power satellite is a very important, which you just know I mentioned. It is going to be a very important requirement for the future. <laughs> the power comes from the satellites, which can be used to desalinate water and you get the drinking water also. This is the debris removal. Debris removal, there are methods, many methods are being worked out. 
and the people have to join together countries have to join together to uh, do that and as was with the rebris capture uh, that is collect a big collector will go and uh, take out all these rebris around the uh, earth because the earth is already crowded with these rebris and the dr with all these technologies being worked out so if you look at the future future is very interesting one is the mining of the scarce resources from moon mars asteroids factory on the moon for mining helium 3 for electricity generation dry ice deposits in the moon which was found out by the chandrayaan 1 as source of fuel for rocket engine moon to be used as a hub of transportation to liberation points mars and other planets solar power satellites and floating power stations and desalination plants for water then safety against possible asteroid collision on the earth this is a very important thing because there is a prediction that to 2080 march 20 march 16th uh, an asteroid is going to hit on the earth so we have to protect the earth solar sails for interplanetary travel removal of space debris operating uh, satellite service should be extended we have to operate service stations in the geo orbit the satellite will do only service like our fuel pumps are there we go and fill the cars fill the fuel in the cars we should do it for the satellites in the orbits so this is what is going to this is the uh, method of the servicing the satellites so there's going to be a lot of things happening in the in orbit servicing capabilities to be built is asteroid we can um, um, get resources from the asteroid a lot of uh, new materials are available on the asteroid so this is the research on that and the protecting from the asteroid and so if you see next 100 years of space research your aeronautics astron all put together you will see there is going to be a big program on planets hypersonics unmanned combat air vehicles planes will not have their pilots unmanned combat vehicles then morphing airframe so the control is done automatically like a bird aircraft, aircraft can fly a huge aircraft which can carry 10000 people for a time then reusable systems uh, then solar power satellite mining in planets space colonies and very importantly in the 100th year we will be settling in another planet that is also possible so the two years have been already located which are uh, very similar to the earth double the size and um, people are doing research on that whether we can go and settle down there the settling is very important because the earth is in the solar system solar system has got a life the sun which has completed 4.7 billion years can live another 5 billion years but the human race is a special uh, given by the god the human race is totally special so that human race should be protected corona corona virus is trying its work to reduce our strength but we have to fight and drive the corona corona virus away from us we should fight people are afraid of that instead of that we should fight with that and get rid of it that's what we should do because human race even one life should not go so for that now the um, ii and uh, the uh, wasagam has just joined i am seeing his face sir good morning yes, sir sir, sir, sir is there. and then um, dr sundramurthy all of you you have got lot of things to do i am showing here you should have a vision is not drdo nal and institutions they are doing research on the aeronautics astronautics and the aviation so you have to bring together with the mission see what will drive the people is the mission so you people should join together probably at the end of this conference to define a mission one for uh, aeronautics mission one for uh, astronautics mission one for a civil aviation then like that what is mission 2 for each area if you define then the people will start working what we need is we have to create synergy between uh, the research organizations academy and industry industry is capable today but we need to uh, tell them this is what we need so we have to bring them 
and give them our technology, then only the, uh, the, the development will happen. So synergy is a very important thing. Aerospace space technology has got a great future and we will achieve advanced aerospace systems and industry complex. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I enjoyed uh, sharing with you some of my thoughts, uh, which will uh, def definitely kindle the minds of the young people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Google. Yes, sir. So thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening session. Uh, I think uh, this has given a lot of vision for our aerospace industry. And uh, it's a wonderfully novel address. I think uh, during this lockdown period, you have not uh, got so much of information how our country is looking into that. And your experience, your knowledge, and uh, your happiness are shared to all our uh, uh, people of our nation, as well as internationally. There are a few participants who are also watching this uh, session. So thank you so much for your uh, presence, as well as the wonderful thoughts on the challenges and opportunity after post-COVID-19. So thank you once again, sir. Thank you so much. So it's an immense pleasure to uh, also invite our Vasagam, sir, who's a Padma Sri, on this uh, session. So Vasagam, sir, are you audible? Can you check up? Sir, we would like to hear your voice, Mr. Vasagam. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, How yes, are you? Sir, yes, sir. How are you? Yeah. Hello. 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 Uh, yes, sir. Here. We can hear you, sir. Here. Awesome, sir. Yeah, you are able to hear? Yes, sir. I am able yes, to hear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can able to hear, sir. So, no issue, sir. So, thank you for uh, okay. uh, Vasagam, sir. Uh, sir, to be in this. So, before we start this uh, session, we just uh, have a small uh, a brief introduction about our Vasagam, sir. This slide, so Vasagam, to... sir. Slide is uh, being shown as thank you. Should we remove that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that Vasagam slides can come or he can come and uh, speak. Yeah. So we are, uh, a small uh, brief about, uh, introduction about our Batmashi Aram Vasagam, sir, who is a mentor for our IEA. Always like uh, an, uh, uh, we can say he's a leader and a visionary. So he's a currently a chancellor of Dr. MGR Education and Research Institute and also chancellor for Karpagam University, Coimbatore. And he was a vice president in the Dr. MGR uh, University. And uh, he was a vice chancellor uh, of MGR University from 2003 to 2006. And uh, he was a director for Karun Institute of Technology, also a chairman of Tamil Nadu Institute of Information Technology. So previously, he was a vice chancellor for Anna University in 1996 to 1999. And uh, he was an uh, outstanding scientist in ISRO. And uh, to be proud, uh, the first satellite, Apple, which we have launched uh, uh, from our hands of India, uh, its uh, project director is our Batmashi Aram Vasagam, sir. So he was a director of Directorate of Advanced Technology and Planning, ISRO headquarters, Bangalore. So he has completed his uh, BE honors from University of Madras in 1963 and MTech from IIT Madras and worked in Indian space program from the inceptions in early 60s. So he is the one of the key person in served as the project director for Apple. That is India's first experimental geostationary communication satellite project during 1977 to 83 timeframe. So he has received so many awards, which includes Bhattrushri and uh, Vikram Sarabhai Award and uh, Brian Roy Award for Space and uh, Dishingus Alumnus Award from IIT. So he's also visiting scientist at the Indian uh, uh, Institute of Space and Astronautical Science and a fellow of uh, National Academy of Science and so many. I think uh, to say about profile, I think it's very detailed. Without wasting mm -hmm. much more time, we would ask our Vascom sir to take up this session. Sir, please. Sir, can you hear us, Vasagam, sir? Yeah. Sir, you can proceed, sir. You can uh, give your guest of honor address. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Please go ahead, sir.
So can you hear us? Uh, can you hear? Sir. Kindly give you a for our, uh, sir. So, Vasakam, sir, you can proceed your uh, guest of honor address. Address. Sir, please proceed with your address, sir. We are audible. Arnavan, can you just talk to him, sir? Can you just call him and check out? See, he's not audible from our side, so please check his uh, audio. Mm. Mm. Yeah, hello? Yes, sir. Ah, sir, we can hear you, sir. We can hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll just begin. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are Hello, able to hear? Yes, yes. We are yes. able to hear you. Oh. Please speak. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes. So good morning to all of you. This is a historic occasion. On one side, we are having, you know, very difficult circumstances. At the same time, we are talking of the future of many things. So first and foremost, let me say that the institution, because I represent the institutional engineers also. The, as the chairman of the Aerospace Engineering Division Board and the, as part of the centenary celebrations of the Institute of Engineers. We are conducting the international events and this is one such event for the Aerospace Engineering Division. In addition, we also have the birth centenary of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai being celebrated, who is the father figure for the Indian Space Program. And Professor Sadish Dhawan is uh, Birth centenary starts from September 25th of this year. So the stalwarts who made something in this field, we salute them first before starting the program. And second, the foundations of the aeronautics in this country has come from Walchand Hirachand, who started the Hindustan Aeronautics, and also the Jadi Tata, who had the first commercial flight for the airmail, you know, that was the first one and then the civil aviation was born. So many, many things have happened and the Royal Air Force also had operations in this, in the Second World War time. More than 400 airfields were created at that time for fighting the war. So many people have done such uh, accomplishments and the infrastructure which came in those days is now supporting the major program and the important thing that you'll have to see is the troubled times. You know, the human body is the host for more than 3 trillion organisms, all virus, bacteria, everything, 3 trillion. So even the stars are only 100 billion, as Carl Sagan, you know, Sivadana Play showed the slide. But the, we are surviving against all those odds. Mm -hmm. Our immunity is built over maybe thousands of years. So how we survive, we will survive all the time to come. And the second, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 is crippling the whole world. Aviation affected totally because all the airports are locked and then the planes are parked on the runways. You will see all kinds of things. And the cargo movement is only for essential supply it is going on. And the other part, aircraft production also stopped and layoff of workers. Even Boeing has sent out 10,000 people just you know, a few days back. And all over the world it is happening. And layoff of workers, whether it is in Asia, Pacific, or in the 
Americas or in Europe, everywhere it is happening. Supply parts from our center because the Boeing company had so outsourced parts from almost 37 countries with only all digital route for the drawings and the materials. Everything was through digital means. So on one side, the IT enabled them to spread the network for the suppliers, but at the same time, it is now getting affected totally. And the space system projects, you know, the all the modernizing, all other things which are happening in the areas. But what I would say on one side, you have seen beautiful slides depicting the growth of space and the defense sector and also the civil aviation sector in this country, especially the navigation system related things. But the future, okay, going beyond the confines of the earth, go to moon or Mars, or even beyond that for the entire solar system. That is all you can say the curiosity component. And maybe sometimes you will be lucky to get some new knowledge, new way of doing things, and then it will also give maybe a much better return. That is one of the important things. But the part which is happening is the assembly testing of your own uh, ISRO is now closed. Infrastructure building has been slowed down. Mm. Absolutely mm. essential service only are maintained. And Chinese long march, in spite of all this, they launched their heaviest uh, you know, payload carrying uh, vehicle, 25 tons in low earth orbit. So that has been also returned part of it. And the other part, the Virgin Galactic is trying to redo the Orbital Science Corporation experiments. The Pegasus was launched, air launched, the, the satellite launch vehicle. And very same thing is now being done by Virgin Galactic with Boeing uh, 747. And the other slow return of commercial flight is happening, you know, trickling passengers and also so many barriers, including the health checks. Are also you know, progress is the who are chosen for that is the Gaganats, we call them. They are being trained in Russia, but now they are waiting just about to re resume the training now. And to, to, tomorrow morning, maybe the commercial crew will fly from the US for the NASA SpaceX joint experiment. And the, we hope they succeed. Because they, that is the initiating so many new things of, you know, doing things at uh, faster, cheaper, better. That route they are trying to demonstrate now. And Chandrayaan and beyond, we have also the other missions, even Mars and many other things that will happen. But the, but I would touch upon the education component. The, uh, the entire AACT, you know, is focused on the experiential learning and not alone beyond curriculum. You have to do many things before you are getting ready for the industry jobs. And that is one thing which is the big lacuna in this country, maybe in many other countries also. So how you blend practice with uh, learning is very, very important. Because our Institution of Engineer AMAE was one such program uh, well thought out in 1930s. And then that has stood the test of time. Many people have played very key roles in many organizations in India and abroad, but uh, including the aviation sector and aeronautics and rocket sector also. But the, the pioneering effort by the California Polytechnic College, Cal Poly it is you know, abbreviated, along with NASA M Center and also with NASA the other NASA centers and the Stanford University, they came up with the CubeSat. Yeah, you know, 10 centimeter cube, that was the module. And then you can put one U, three U, you know, even 12 U up to that, they have built satellites. So this is where I think, you know, the Bartrutan who had the around the globe nonstop flight, he built, Bartrutan was a student of Cal Poly. And we also have the, you know, the composites activity that was entirely composite uh, aircraft. And same thing with the 
the CubeSat is now blossoming in many, many countries, many, many areas. Of course, even you know, our PSLV, as Sudan Play told, it has launched many of those things from other countries, student built satellites at a very lower cost and economic cost. So that is happening. And the orbital debris mitigation, what you have seen, these are all ideas and dreams. It is like, you know, you open a bag of beans and then you try to collect it again. So it is as bad or as simple as that. So that is the, ultimately, whether it is a non-contact thing or a net will be capturing or it will be a lesser, lesser energy, whatever way you have to remove this debris is a very big thing. The thousands, 22,000 plus objects and tracking them and then, you know, getting their orbit, how they decay, all those things. And then controlled descent is now going to be made mandatory for many of those things, whether it is low Earth orbit or even geostationary. Geostationary, there is a common understanding that they will be removing it out of the useful orbit. So at least that is happening. But in other places, the, the last stage also is traveling and then it finally explodes or it goes into many, many fragments. So these are not yet understood how to handle this kind of uh, things. And the other, the rocket lab, I need a different way of doing things, including you know, setting up a launch pad in New Zealand and also in US. And the University of Toronto, Institute of Aerospace Studies in Canada, they did the small satellite initiative long back. University of Utah did. NASA is James Fletcher, who left NASA after resurrecting the space shuttle. He became the president of that university. And there, a lot of work was being done on the small satellites. And many, many other universities are now participating very, very actively in this in Europe, in Japan in China, many other, even France also, we have people. And the one of the things that we are doing, even Israel, they are doing with the high school students, they build satellites. And these are things which are happening. And the one of the initiatives as part of the uh, thing was the 75 years of India's independence. We wanted to have the Gaganyan as the climax event and getting the Indians sent to space and then get them back. And the, this is one major goal for the country. But at the same time, we also thought the student community of this country, 4,500 plus colleges in this country, they should be capable of building small satellites and 75 of them, 75 institutions individually or consortia, and then they should get them launched by 2022, maybe with the Indian built launch vehicle, like small satellite launch vehicle, which is just about to be uh, experimented now, tested very soon in the launching and other things will take place. So this is one thing where we want to move the workforce among the students and, and it is a highly interdisciplinary activity is the two subjects the AICT has mandatorily done that two of them should be interdisciplinary and also the, they have to have partly practice, partly theoretical, so interdisciplinary groups. So this uh, small satellite will ident you know, very nicely fill that role and that is what I think we are trying to promote among the student community, academic institutions in the country, and also maybe the, some of the research labs, those who are going to do the internship. So this is happening now. And the other, of course, you have heard the uh, Sivadan Place presentation on the defense, where you know, our Tejas is now going to for production mode, which is the indigenous uh, you know, combat aircraft. Unmanned version of that also will be built and the aircraft, but the aircraft maintenance and life extension has not yet taken off properly in this country, even though we have Hindustan University had a TIFA core program for doing this in the, our Chennai airport. So I hope that this is spreading much better because where skill and knowledge both are combined and guaranteed reliability has to be made. So this you'll have to see. 
and the our of course now the new things which are happening we have the foreign direct investment is now you know permitted in the defense sector and the co development of course the promos is the initial you know example you can say many more will follow then we have the other very similar activities for the co development in civil air transport aircraft india doesn't have a civil transport aircraft other than the original avro and that is also now not really made you know productionized in kanpur so the we are starving for that and the c17 and all what we are getting for troop transport equipment and armaments transport these are not yet there even forest fire fighting we don't have a plane available in india oil well fire fighting we don't have the uh, means so variety of things which we have to think of so when we are talking of you know the ideal scientific and technological achievements same time we have to find the real need of the country the other the the uncharted territories i would just like to end like uh, unmanned aerial and combat vehicle so the uav program was attempted in this country uh, even as part of the you know ndrf which is part of the institute of engineers along with uh, academic institutions and research institutions more than 130 projects were completed and that uh, all the outcome is available both for the researchers and also for the industry people to go for production and patenting and maybe marketing outside also because the today the scenario is that the low cost manes other than the covid pandemic it is also in parallel it is attacking india and they say unmanned vehicles will be used drones will be used for spraying so this is something you know when we have technology and understanding but we have not anticipated this type of sudden demand and then get ready for meeting that uh, you know increasing demand at a very short time whether it is ppe or any other things capacity is there but you can't scale up in a short time so this is where i think we'll have to see and the other cargo operations will be bulk of the things where actually you know separate cargo planes are there but we also have carry the the cargo in the you know passenger aircraft in the belly and that is now affected so many of the supply chains are totally in disarray so this has to be separate uh, you know cargo planes have to be also made in this country and that should be supported by government and the also it would be you know a useful life of an airframe maybe around 30 years engines have to be replaced of 10 years avionic every 3 years so that cycle we have not understood nor made it possible in this country and the other contract r&d for other countries international programs as we have so you know seen there is always a, you know area where it is possible to get a window of opportunity so boeing and eads out of the necessity when they are marketing some of their products to india they also have to spend more than about 30% of that money in india in the case of israel it is almost 50% so where is the workforce what kind of work they are expecting to deliver to those people out of that 30% share or 50% share so this is an opportunity which i think the thousands of engineers who are coming out not alone aeronautics or the aerospace or the electronic engineers it is mechanical engineers manufacturing engineers quality assurance people and chemical engineers many many people we have to think of that kind of opportunity and when are we going to export indian aviation products in a massive way long back i think when former prime minister rajiv gandhi once told you know when are we going to make electronic chips not merely the banana chips so how long we are going to make the banana chips because in those days you know the word banana republic was a derisive remark so it is partly dictatorial regimes 
and you know dominating the government policy so that i think the electronics is the weakest link achilles heel of india's every segment out of that aeronautics also is suffering i think that we will have to understand so this one thing the foundry at what cost whether it is astronomical cost we don't think so it may be 3 billion dollar 5 billion dollar kind of investment but worth for the returns that we will have to think of and the whole world scenario is 1050 space missions with an outlay of 450 billion dollar in the over next 10 years so this is the broad picture out of that what india whether we can get a share of 5% at least that is what i think you will have to aspire for and the un, unfulfilled demand of the domestic demands for transponders the world over there 11000 transponders already we are also hiring from foreign satellites but when are we going to have our own satellite transponders leased out to others i think the industry has to come forward to take this has a big opportunity for make a good business and succeed that is what i think communication is the bread and butter next only maybe the imagery and the remote sensing all other things they are more for elite users mm-hmm. this uh, the communication touches each and every person in the world so that i think we have to now immediately get on with that kind of thing and the other part is the curriculum and you know whether the we have opportunities for the young people who are completing the aeronautics program in spite of the you know almost 17000 people nearly 9000 and lot are engineers and scientists in isro we have less than 100 people with aeronautics degree and even computer science you don't have too many people i think you must understand the balance of the workforce requirement even in r&d in manufacturing in testing everywhere it is highly interdisciplinary product aerospace is highly interdisciplinary so you have to now gear up for that kind of environment and then the other the piloting unmanned air vehicles and also the pilot training is another critical segment which we have not yet been able to do and the aviation medicine is another area so variety of things are happening so you might see people who are going on the in the current flights many many places you will be seeing them they are you know what i would say the suddenly there is a demand for the you know so many safety aspects even for a passenger so all those things have to be documented it has to be codified and systematically followed so that how we are going to do we will have to see and the space and the aviation law is another area domain where india is just making a beginning mm-hmm. without a space law many many things are not possible and then the compensation the also the accident cover the variety of things which you have not understood the business end of the science and technology i think that has to be also mastered so i hope that this program not alone it is reaching the students and academic people and industry people in india I am, i am very happy that it is reaching out many many other countries around the globe so i hope that this event will be a good success and you will be really able to get a new way of interacting with the entire world thank you so much yes thank you thank you so much sir i think for your wonderful uh, uh, the guest of honor sir i think uh, you have given a perspective of all like uh, what is required after post covid as well as i think uh, the earlier how the india has gone aerospace industry and uh, the very the important uh, the uh, youth of our country how they are looking going to for the aerospace sector in different perspective definitely i think they have got enough knowledge and uh, we are so happy i think you have joined us with a honor and uh, it's so immense pleasure again uh, from the organizing committee as well as institute of aeronautics astronautics and aviation and the institute of engineer samarit trade center we are thankful so much for our patmati aram vasagam sir who have joined and uh, as a mentor as a leader and as a, always a teacher thank you so much sir i think uh, it is a time i think uh, uh, we are going to conclude this session i think uh, before we conclude i think uh, i should uh, 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 say some few of statistics what we have uh, uh, reached for this conference uh, i think bala i think you can uh, share the uh, our uh, the statistics for all the audience speakers and guests 
uh, till i think uh, today the total response uh, through our google form we have received is uh, 1710 and out of that the final response is 1500 almost 200 were duplicate so if you try to see out of that i think hindustan uh, college is almost ranks world of more than uh, 70 participants we have uh, got uh, many participants from uh, premier institutions like uh, iit chennai iit kanpur iit gandhinagar and also uh, uh, mit madras institute of technology srm and uh, much more institutions of uh, nearly something uh, around uh, 966 students have uh, uh, joined in it and 295 faculties and 144 industrialists and uh, 87 people across the email so also i think 126 company people have responded especially uh, hil bangalore istro and uh, much more i think uh, cpcl uh, many industries so these are the responses and uh, college wise we try to see i think uh, uh, many private institutions as well as a uh, premier institution so the response from uh, if at all we see from foreign i think we got a good response from california uh, sweden carlonia canada spain and uh, uh, we got from Florida, Virginia, France, and South Korea. So, and a uh, few people from NASA, Boeing, and uh, LDRA, and Saffron, France, and uh, Sunshine. So, very happy to share to all the statistics to all our uh, delegates, as well as our uh, panelists and the speakers and the eminent uh, guests. So, we are, uh, yeah, so we are, uh, uh, the statistic of a 10 days conference on this uh, aerospace so we have reached much higher i think uh, the uh, uh, audience delegates are waiting for much more panelists to discuss so thank you so much sir can i ask our karuna karan who is a professor from hindustan uh, university as well as uh, a very important person from iia to deliver the word of thanks karuna karan please arise away and stop not as vivekananda says Every time when the disaster strikes or uh, difficult times, we prove ourselves, especially we Indians. And also uh, across the globe, the human race fights for its uh, survival and also evolution. Uh, this international conference, especially during this pandemic time, uh, crisis management time, we are gathering ourselves to make our mankind and aerospace sector to move across and uh, uh, along with young student community. First, I uh, uh, take pleasure in thanking and welcoming both of our uh, chief guests and guests of honor, Badmu Bhushan, our A. Sivadana Pillai, sir, and uh, our Badmu Shri Aram Basam, sir. It's a great honor for us to have you once again in IAAA once. So, uh, IAAA is an young professional body and a foundation which started in 2017, as our uh, vice president said. And, uh, a lot of uh, aero enthusiasts across India from DRTO, ISRO, and industry, uh, especially academicians, came together and started in 2017 MIT. And then it uh, started to act very efficiently, especially where there is a need and where there is a need to push our uh, target being at least. Uh, in 2018 19, uh, IEEE has supported IIT, Dohati's uh, Technici, even IIT. And have launched uh, uh, various aero competitions in IIT Shastra every year. And uh, in uh, 2018, IEEE launched uh, uh, officially entered into a Guinness attempt with uh, 14,000 school students to promote aero enthusiasm along, among the school students with paper plane, and uh, which gathered around 14,000. And in Hyderabad, MLRIT venue, we, we got around 7,000 school students participating in the uh, competition. And uh, in 2019, Jan, we have also brought 10 air, uh, hot air balloons. And along with uh, other partners, we have conducted hot air balloon festival, international hot air balloon festival at Chennai. And we are uh, progress, like IAAA is contributing along with every professional body, premier institutions. And its main focus is to bring on the next generation leaders. We see in aerospace, there are, that is a very big uh, difference age group. Uh, the leaders will be from 35 other, or else they will be above uh, 45 or 50. So there is a need that we need to bring on all young leaders to take charge and realize that they are the next uh, uh, leaders of aerospace. So that's what we are trying to do. And uh, uh, I thank IEA chairman, uh, IEA Tamil Nadu chairman, Ramadasar, 
who have effectively uh, coordinated this event. And I need to thank uh, uh, Mr. Gopal, Dr. Sushil, and uh, people behind that IEA Tamil Nadu team, Bala, Ramesh, Sendil, Tilton. And uh, if I have missed someone, please excuse me. And we are going to have a continuous uh, series of events for these two days. A lot of panel members across the globe and also participants across the globe who are going to see these things. And this is really going to give us a very in-detail uh, uh, knowledge about how we are going to face the uh, COVID, post-COVID condition especially. We are going to discuss about space technology. Yes, as uh, Vasam sir and uh, uh, Sivan Pilesa has said, we are going to discuss about space law and also defense uh, and related policies and uh, aviation aerospace industries in academies, uh, how the academic is being affected and what kind of uh, aerospace uh, uh, changes will be happen in academics. And we have startups and uh, tooling and training software uh, training industries. So all together, we are going to have a very detailed uh, insight and, and also the need uh, and the role of professional body organizations also going to be discussed. So uh, with this, I thank everyone who have uh, worked a lot to bring this conference within uh, 18 days, within 18 days. And also I thank the paper presenters who have uh, done a very good work and the team who have selected it, Dr. Uh, Satya Narayan Gupta, Dr. Risham Pandekrehe, and the chairman of the paper presenters, Muthuraman from uh, PMIST and also Dr. Uh, Muruganandam. And, uh, and I thank everyone who have uh, contributed a lot as a team. And uh, with this, I thank the entire organizing team and move on. I'm giving the rise to the uh, comparer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sarnagran, for your uh, good attempt. So once again, to all the delegates and chief guests, so we are on the uh, in international online conference on challenges of operational aeronautics, aeronautical, astronautics, and aviation. So much awaiting session. I think panel discussions we are going to have uh, right now. Uh, we have a four eminent speakers with a moderator. Uh, who I think uh, with initiation, I think uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. S. Pandian, sir, who is a former director of SAC Star Islo, who is my mentor and my guru, I can say. And we have uh, Dr. Anita Sengupta, who is a research associate professor, University of South California. And she also was working with NASA on the Mars Orbiter. And uh, we have Dr. Bharat Gopal Swami, distinguished senior fellow over us, and Dr. V. Balaji, who is a senior research engineer, NIA. The moderator for the session, I think we have our uh, organizing committee members, as well as the dynamic of Sushil Shaker, who was a former NPP fellow, NASA AME. So before we start, I thank all our uh, IEA chairman, IAEA, uh, the uh, vice president, as well as the committee members, and especially our Batma Bhushan, Dr. A. Sivadana Pillai, sir, and Batma Sri, Dr. R. M. Vasadam, sir, for their presence and uh, initiating this conference in a very higher way. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, guidance and support. Definitely, I think uh, uh, with your support, I think we will organize much more conferences. Definitely, the knowledge, what you have, has to be spread throughout the globe and the younger generation of our country is waiting for it. Thank you so much. Can I ask our Dr. Sushil Shekhar to take up this session, the first panel on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic situation. Sushil? Can you hear me? Yeah, so yes. Yeah, okay. please. Thank you very much. Uh, just, a, uh, just a curious question. There are 25 screens that I can, uh, 25 panel members on the screen. Is there any way where we can just have the panelists alone on the screen and not everyone else? It might be a little confusing for people who are watching it online. Uh, no problem. I think our uh, Balawa will take care of it. They'll be separately, they'll be put up the first and second panel. So when they started to uh, convey their message, I think they'll be on the screen. Okay, anyway, uh, let me just start ahead. We're already about uh, 30 minutes late. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to watch these panel discussions. And uh, I have to start thanking, by all the pan thanking all the panelists for accepting our invites uh, in really short time. As uh, Professor Karuna Karan said, this program was brainstormed over a period of three weeks. So it's nearly just 20 days that we put together uh, this series of discussions. Um, also, we have been uh, having panelists waiting on the call from the US and it's pretty late there already. So um, I appreciate their enthusiasm to participate in this. I also apologize for the 30 minute delay. 
Uh, I also have to appreciate the impressive marketing and publicity campaign put up by uh, IEI and IEEE. Um, they managed to garner, I think, about 1,500 interested students, faculty, uh, professionals, and researchers to participate in this program. Okay, uh, let me go ahead with, uh, with a very brief introduction of what uh, you're going to look at, and um, I'll essentially introduce the panelists at the end of it. So we're trying something very new here. Uh, what we're trying to do is basically address the elephant in the room uh, and try to make sense of the current situation um, it's a pandemic-driven lockdown. So not just in India, this is happening everywhere in the world uh, to different extents. The situation that we're dealing with is the uncertainty with regards to the future uh, of uh, industry, of businesses, of academia, and of research, particularly in the fields of aeronautics and aerospace and aviation. Um, and to make sense of it, we would like to ask experts in the field about their take on the impact of the pandemic. Uh, uh, and the lockdown and getting their perspectives on what they see could be done to get us all out of this sticky mess. Um, rather than just get a one-sided perspective from either the industry or from the government or from the academia, uh, we're trying to do something unique here where we're bringing in three separate groups of people uh, from each of those organizations uh, and uh, areas of work and then trying to brainstorm and figure out a, a more holistic approach towards finding out solutions for this. And I believe the students are predominantly students, final year, pre-final year students who would like to know what to look forward to in the, in the next six months to the next year. And even young professionals and a few older enthusiasts too, just to see whether this would be a stable industry in the coming months, coming years, coming decades even. Um, so we figured we'd all be eager to know what you could do, what you should look forward to when you graduate, uh, and uh, how we can all tackle this, these issues collectively. Um, as I just said, we separated the panels out uh, into three groups. One would consist of researchers and policy makers from policy wonks from government labs. Uh, one includes seasoned industry experts who can give us perspectives. Uh, on where their focus is going to be and some points on the economics of the situation. And uh, the third panel includes academicians and professors uh, from different institutes and colleges. So this is how I plan to structure this, these discussions. So what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce each of the panelists, uh, read out their bio, give them about five to 10 minutes to introduce themselves, um, talk about what they, uh, how they perceive the, the current situation and uh, go on to the next panelist and so on. And then at the end of it, there'll be a Q&A session where I have more questions for each of the panelists. Um, I guess with that, uh, let me start off with, now one quick thing, um, since some of the panelists are in the US and it's very late out there, uh, what I will do is I'll uh, shuffle the order in which I'm going through the panelists. And I'll start with uh, Dr. Anista Sengupta and uh, she's dialed in from Los Angeles right now. I'm going to read out a, a brief, brief bio uh, of her background and uh, ask her to give a five or 10 minute talk on, on this particular uh, topic. Um, okay, so um, Dr. Sengupta is a research associate professor at the University of Southern California. And uh, she teaches the only entry, descent, and landing class in all of the West Coast for graduate students. In, uh, in the aerospace departments. Um, before joining uh, USC, she was, uh, for over 20 years, had been developing technologies that had enabled uh, exploration of Mars, of asteroids, and uh, exploration of deep space as well. Uh, she had started out her career uh, designing and devising launch vehicles and communication satellites at Boeing. Um, and uh, as a part of her doctoral research, she designed engines, developed ion engines that were power, that powered the Dawn spacecraft, uh, which reached Vestage, so that giant asteroid, and uh, Ceres, which is a dwarf planet in the uh, main asteroid. Planet. This was way back in 2006. Um, after that, she joined JPL uh, and uh, was responsible for the supersonic parachute system, uh, which was integral to the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars. This happened in 2012. If anyone's familiar with the, uh, with the YouTube video titled Seven Minutes of Terror from EPL, uh, she was on that team and, uh, and describes how the entire combination of uh, events transpired. It's fascinating. Um, and following that, from 2012 to 2017, uh, she managed and led the uh, 
the development of the Cole Atom Laboratory. Uh, it's a laser cooling quantum physics facility uh, for the International Space Station. Uh, in addition to her background in, uh, in space, uh, she's also uh, taken up roles in the private sector uh, as a senior executive um, developing uh, like a vacuum set up uh, with magnetic levitating systems uh, for electrically propelled high-speed transportation for the Hyperloop system with, uh, with Virgin Hyperloop as a senior vice president of the engineering systems there. She's also currently leading the development of a hybrid electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, EVTOL uh, urban mobility system. Uh, she's a co-founder and the chief product officer uh, at ASX, which is Airspace Experience Technology. Uh, and is trying to develop uh, a VTOL system which is emission free, which could revol revolutionize travel within urban environment and uh, also make sure that uh, the carbon footprint of these transport systems uh, significantly reduced. Um, just as a background, she graduated with a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Southern California. Um, uh, Dr. Sengupta, could you uh, give us a couple of minutes or maybe five to 10 minutes of introduction, please? Sure. So thank you for having me. And um, it's wonderful to connect with everybody in India. I actually did a similar event uh, related to the commercial crude launch a few days ago. So uh, it's late here, but uh, it's nice to see you all in the morning. Can't wait to come back. Um, I would leave probably limit my remarks uh, to something a little bit shorter um, on the five minute side and focused on how I think that the COVID pandemic is really changing the way we're all living our lives and the way that we're thinking about um, our environment. And so one of the things that the COVID pandemic has shown us in sort of a global level experiment is the impact of reducing uh, uh, our impact um, on climate change, right? So what we've seen with the reduction in road travel and air travel is that the air quality has improved, um, the skies have become clearer, and it's actually a nice thing. So it's ironic how um, this terrible disaster has also showed us that we actually can change our environment by reducing our carbon footprint. And so I think um, even though it's a terrible thing that we're dealing with as human society and the tragedy and the human death, I think we can come out of this with um, you know, necessity being the mother in invention and come up with ways to reduce our carbon footprint going forward, because that's probably the right thing to do. And I think the transportation sector naturally um, combines with aerospace as well as with um, mechanical engineering disciplines. And I think that's kind of the way to go forward. Um, when it comes to space exploration, I think space exploration and space exploration design methodologies teach you to be very efficient in the way you design systems in terms of power utilization, uh, uh, any kind of resource utilization. And so if we can implement some of those problem solving skills into the private sector, into the transportation sector, we can actually help to solve some of the challenges that we have with climate change using that kind of aerospace discipline moving forward. One of the other issues I see more from the sort of um, academic side or from being an educator side is that now students are having to learn in a very different way. In the past, students were able to interact with other students, with the professors by sitting in class, and now everyone is having to learn online. And that's a very different experience. And so it'll be interesting to see how that changes the way um, young people enter the job market if they spend one or two years in their academic um, undergraduate education learning in this different way. But once again, there may be benefits that come from that where people are more able to work in remote environments because they've learned to be a student um, at working in those remote environments. So I can see that if we can look for ways that we can leverage some of the challenges that we've faced over the course of the past few months and use that to solve both uh, challenges on the climate change side and make changes in the way that we operate our daily lives, such as having remote work more commonly, we can actually come out of this maybe stronger than we started. Thanks, thanks very much. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, uh, if you have a little bit more time, could I just finish off the introductions of the other panelists and then come back to you with a few questions? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. S. Pandian uh, next, and he's a, a distinguished scientist uh, at the Indian Space Research Organization. He's currently the Vikram Sarabhai Distinguished Professor at uh, VSSC in Trivandrum. Uh, he was previously the director of the Satish Savan Space Center in Sri Harikota uh, between 2018 and 2019, uh, and was also the associate director of projects at VSSC before that, and the director of ISRO's propulsion complex, IPRC, even before that. Uh, at VSSC, he was responsible for aerodynamic design and characterization of launch vehicles, and these included the ASLV, PSLV, GSLV, GSLV Mark III, several sounding rockets, air breathing vehicles, re-entry modules, and uh, reusable launch vehicles. And he was also responsible for the mission design, aerodynamic, aerothermal design, and qualification of all launch vehicles uh, at ISRO. 
Um, he's made significant contributions to the Chandrayaan uh, program and the Mangalyaan thermal protection uh, and trajectory design, as well as the GSLV Mark II and Mark III trajectory designs uh, while at BSSC. Um, at SDSC, while he was director, uh, under his leadership, uh, they were able to launch the BSLV C42 to C46 launches and the GSLV Mark II uh, F11 and GSLV Mark III launched during his time over. Um, and he was the chairman of the launch authorization board for all launch vehicles uh, at SDSC. He's, he's also responsible for setting up the, uh, the gallery, the viewing gallery, which can host 10,000 people for launches at Sri Harikota. So we can thank him for that. Um, Dr. Panyan completed his bachelor's from uh, the Madras Institute of Technology and uh, his master's at IAC Bangalore. Uh, he has a PhD from IIT Guwahati. He's a recipient of several awards, including uh, ISRO's Eminent Engineer Award, Lifetime Achievement Award, Eminent Alumni Award from the IISC. Uh, he's a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineers, the Aeronautical Society of India, and the Institution of Engineers in India. Uh, he's the coordinator of uh, Aeronautical Research and Development Board, uh, which is a, a panel under DRDO, and is a member on Shastra's Academic Board and Karunya University's Academic Council as well. Uh, with that brief introduction, uh, Dr. Pandian, if you were able to uh, uh, say a few words uh, for five to ten minutes on uh, on what you think about COVID-19 and how you perceive things right now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sushit Sekhar. Um, Mr. Sivadana Pillai, Supersonic Missile Man of India, Encyclopedia of uh, Space, Dr. Vasagam, Ramdas, Chairman IEA, T.K. Sundramurti, Vice President, IAA, Professor Karnagran, Mr. Gogul, all my co-panelists, delegates, very warm good morning to all of you. First of all, let me congratulate and compliment the organizers for this wonderful event. And it is very timely and opt since we are in the midst of COVID-19. So, I would like to touch upon what uh, the impact of aerospace, impact on aerospace and the uh, different sector due to COVID. In my view, this world underestimated COVID-19 in terms of both its propensity to spread and cause harm and its ability to bring businesses and whole economics to whole halt. Many countries are in the midst of executive, either mitigating, mitigation or all out suppression strategy that are taking a toll on both populace and industries. In fact, this COVID-19 is blessing in disguise for some of them, that is such as retail, fast moving consumer goods and medical commerce, mainly because unanticipated demand growth due to panic buying, while for some other sectors such as hospitality and civil aviation, the pandemic has resulted in a very great <laughs> downturn. It is very important to note that while some type of businesses, the effects of pandemic will be very pronounced in short term, for others, the effect may take more time to manifest. The latter is specifically true for industries that are exposed to a large number of externalities, that is politics, economics, and social. The aerospace and defense fall into this category. The coronavirus pandemic is creating ripples across the globe, global aerospace component industry with the red lights flashing over two most important characteristics, that is global chain supply, supply, which move material and component rapidly across borders and the fabrication facility and the large number of employees working in close proximity. Broadly speaking, the effect of the aerospace and the defense industries because of the spread of COVID-19 and related actions to curtail the contagion can be considered into five major impact points. That is, one is the production, manufacturing facilities and supply chain could be affected, business development, effort could be affected, some will lose, some may gain, demand for defense equipment and related service may go down, Companies may have to make tough choices that could impact finances and competencies. Stock price, of course, may decline, will bring secondary effect. As far as uh, the 
The effect of each of the above major impact points will differ based on the size of aerospace and defense companies, nature of business, production portfolios, supply chain dependencies, and business plan, just to name a few. In ISRO, ISRO had a plan for launching nine PSLV, three GSLV, two GSLU Mark III, which includes unmanned flight for human space program, Gaganyaan, and two small satellite launch vehicle in the year 2020, 2021. Because of COVID-19, flow of hardware, subsystems, raw material, finding, funding, and human resources availability are seriously affected. Unlike other technologies, development of launch vehicle and satellite requires long lead time for realization. Hence, impact of COVID-19 may last in national space program for another two to three years. So the COVID-19 posed a great challenge to ISRO for accomplishing the ongoing missions, as well as the future missions, including the prestigious programs like Gaganyaan, Chandrayaan-3, and the Aditya. Let us change the aviation requirement may come down and hence those opportunities can be utilized to compensate the present conditions what is emerging in aerospace. Now coming to orders, you know, approximately 200 billion of market, 200 billion dollar market value has lost in the US aerospace industries alone. The aerospace and defense select industry index includes industry leaders such as Boeing, Rocket Martin, and Grumman is down over 40%. For the entire month of January, Boeing did not have a single order for the first time since 1962. Airbus II had the same issue. Coming to China, the Chinese aerospace manufacturing main suppliers of multiple components used in aircraft and was the first to feel the full effect of the virus. Airbus closed a factory in Tianjin, which is home to its completion center for the Airbus 320 and the Airbus 350 models. The factory produces 300 uh, six A320 aircraft per month, which is about 10% of the current delivery. And all of you know that as on January, the plant had block, black, uh, backlog of 7,725, most of which Airbus 320 and Airbus 380. China also supplies parts such as uh, horizontal and vertical tiles, doors, wing panels, wire harnesses for every Boeing jets, including the 737 MAX, 777, Dream, uh, the 787 Dreamliner, and all. Coming to Indian scenario, so India also contributing very major way into the uh, Old aerospace arena and uh, emerging as a major partner in major programs. And what I would like to say is India is several hundred small and medium and large Indian firms manufacturing or assembly, uh, something like 10,000 crore worth of aerospace component annually for original equipment manufacturers, such as Boeing, Airbus, Rocket Martin, and Bell Helicopter. Being Boeing alone sourced over 7,000 crore worth of component and services last year from over 200 Indian companies. Airbus in turn sourced over 4,500 crores worth of component and services from 45 Indian companies. Indian suppliers from large corporates such as Tata's and Mahindra's to medium-sized high-tech manufacturers such as Dynamic Technologies catered to common imperative supplying top quality components to their respective OEM within a rigid time schedule. Interfering with this now are disruption relating to COVID-19. This includes delays or non-arrival of raw material and inputs, disrupted financial flows, and growing absenteeism among the production line workers. Indian firms are searching for answers at these three levels government assistance in managing the situation, assistance and clarity from OEM, and the internal measures to contain the pandemic. In fact, you know, the government intervention may end up being a deciding factor on which enterprises will be winners and losers in the COVID-19 crisis. 
given the potential size of coronavirus related corporate bailout governments are apt to place sting on the money requiring for requiring for instance that companies maintain certain employment level are agreeing to specified reduction in carbon dioxide emission for instance france has already said it will ask air france to cut its emission and hence the number of domestic flights is offered as a condition of receiving covid bailout other nations are expected to follow this suit coming to my the economic impact all of you know the covid-19 pandemic has the potential to trigger a global economic crisis of significant dimensions affecting all industries one of the industry sector in the eye of coronavirus storm is aerospace global air traffic has been brought to almost a complete standstill by covid-19 outbreak while air traffic has consistently shown a solid recovery from previous crisis the debate is wide open about how traffic will recover following the current crisis and what will this mean for civil aircraft manufacturing industry the supply chain and aftermarket support previous crisis like uh, 9 by 11 sars and other financial crises in 2008 and 9 all demonstrated a recovery along b or u shaped curves back to pre crisis growth plan as covid-19 is fully global crisis of unprecedented magnitude we need to consider whether we might see an l shaped recovery with a consistently lower level of air traffic and permanently slower growth after crisis so under this circumstances one has to work for new normal production rates either it is industry or as a company they have to work for the normalization of the whole process considering the present scenario so they have to come out with the new normal and this way this conference also is called new normal the right size and potential repositioning operation must start immediately to this end company strategy its industrial footprint and operating model need to be reviewed and blueprint developed to fit with the new normal and provide right framework for short term actions and strategic moves at industry level companies and governments will need to work closer closely together to ensure that key industrial capability do not fall through the crack as this would put the whole industry at risk therefore the industry to how to quickly reach a consensus on the new normal define a joint plan for how to transform the industry from the status quo to the new normal identify at risk elements in the transition process and develop plans to support them once this picture is clear government support may need to be called upon to safeguard short term functioning of the industries and help manage the transition to the new normal for the strategically important sector thank you Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Pandya. Uh, because we are running short of time for the panelists in the U uh, in the US, I'm going to go through some of the questions that I have for uh, Dr. Anita Sengupta quickly, and then uh, she has to leave early because it's already late for her. And then I'll move over to uh, Dr. Balaji and uh, Dr. Bharat after that. Um, I hope that's okay with uh, with everyone. Um, uh, okay, Dr. Sengupta. So the the current geopolitical situation uh, has essentially amplified uh, nationalistic voices all over the world uh, and for someone who's worked in deep deep space operations um, how do you see the future of uh, projects like uh, the ISS or uh, even the operation of the deep space network where several other countries have used uh, antenna in canberra in uh, goldstone and in madrid uh do you see those as relics of the past or do you still see an avenue towards that sort of a global interaction or um is everyone just going to hunker down and then become nationalist and then uh, work within themselves uh, well i i hope not i think what we're seeing on the nationalist front um is a phase and cyclical so i don't expect it to stay um and i think this probably happened before and will probably happen again as history tends to repeat itself um uh, but i do believe in the context of space exploration it really depends upon the nature of the mission so if the nature of the mission is scientific exploration or making humanity a space faring society then we must we have to be collaborative um because we wouldn't be able to pull the resources to make something of that size which has an infrastructure component to it a 
reality. Um, but if it's inherently a commercial venture, such as mining operations, telecommunications, uh, space tourism, then of course you're going to have the commercial aspect, an element of competition, an element of revenue generation, and the efficiencies and the technologies that come from that. So it really does depend, but I don't see an end at all to a US funded space program, Indian funded space program, European funded space program. And I see collaboration going forward for scientific exploration and sort of um, hopefully future human uh, colonies on the moon and Mars. Uh, but in, this, in the current situation with the uh, economic downturn all over the world, it's going to be difficult to convince governments to fund not necessarily feel good, but uh, space exploration, like say, uh, find out how uh, Neptune, uh, the atmosphere of Neptune is, or some of the, uh, the, the surfaces of Saturn's uh, moons look like. Uh, do you see more lopsided um, commercial exploration, like you said, mining uh, on Mars or on Moon, rather than these? Is that going to be more transactional between, say, US would come out and say, okay, we are going to do this, and we can uh, give you, give, say, uh, the Soviet or Russia or India this much amount of effort? Is it going to be more transactional, or do you see more effort in the feel good uh, sector of, of space exploration? I do still see a distinction between scientific missions, such as, you know, exploring the, the moons of Saturn and going further out into our solar system. And to be honest with you, robotic exploration missions, which I spent the majority of my career working on, are incredibly cost effective, huge return on investment, uh, wonderful job opportunities, and they cost very, very little relative to, you know, sending people to the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars. Um, and if you took a, you know, take a look at the mission that I worked on for years, Curiosity, a rover, maybe $2 billion US over a period of, you know, 10 years, it's actually pretty small when you look at the overall size of the US budget. So I think they're actually a drop in the bucket when it comes to gov government expenditures. And then when you take a look at ISRO's um, space missions, they're even more cost effective. So once again, I think they represent a really small portion of a government budget. That being said, the commercial sector has the ability to develop an entirely new ecosystem. And when you have an entirely new ecosystem, you actually create jobs. Uh, so that element of the commercial uh, space um, sector taking over for human space exploration actually has the potential to self-fund itself and create jobs as a result. So I do see an element of, I guess, transactional is one way to put it, but I actually think it's a great commercial venture and it actually stimulates the economy. So I think many people think that moving forward into the 2020 decade and beyond, that space actually is going to be the new boom in the economy. Okay. I guess we have to tweak the narrative in such a way that we convince people to keep going towards the free good sector as well as the commercial cooperation as well. Um, Right now, you are a research faculty at USC. How do you see the research focus at the university level changing, say, six months from now, uh, a year from now, or even five years from now? Uh, do you see more focus on government funding or are there more industry funding in these fields? So it's a hard one to predict, and I will say in the near term, it's going to be very hard to conduct research in general because of the social distancing restrictions. So if you're not doing a computational project and you're doing any kind of um, hardware-oriented um, experimental project, it's actually going to be very difficult to do any kind of meaningful research probably for the next uh, six months or so. Um, I also see that governments are going to have to refocus their funding, you know, per our last uh, question um, in the next six to 12 months as to what is the highest priority, what is lower priority. But I think moving forward 12 months, from now, um, necessity is the mother of invention, and I think governments will look to work with the tech sector, with um, academia, and coming together with other government sectors to be able to find solutions to some of these challenges. And I have a great example of that, uh, which is ironically rocket science, is that um, one of the things that people are trying to understand with the virus is basically how far do the viral particles spread as a result of a sneeze or a cough, and what do they do? They turn to rocket science and computational fluid dynamics to do simulations of how far um, this fluidized uh, aerosol media would go. So I think there's these really fascinating ways that people can actually work together to solve these challenges. And so that's a government funded project, of course. Um, but I do think that there will be very likely a lot of commercially funded aerospace projects, which then result in masters and PhD theses moving forward probably within the next two to three years with companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin doing a bulk of the work to um, set up that first human colony for sure, there's going to be a lot of research which is privately funded as a result. Okay, that's something to look forward to. And I'm going to segue from your point that necessity is the mother of all invention. Uh, so the current response to pandemic by different governments has been drastically different by those governments run by women and those that aren't run by women. Uh, I mean, this, this is 
blatantly obvious data that uh, uh, that's apparent to everyone. How do you shape the uh, the industry culture, the academic culture, the political culture uh, to rethink systemic biases, uh, getting more women and girls into studying engineering sciences, getting them into more powerful positions in each of these? Um, some of these practices are counterproductive, and some of them are even morally wrong. How do you how do you uh, modify the narrative to get people to think along those lines. Well, unfortunately, it's sort of like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't have enough women, you never have enough women, sadly. And we definitely need more women in the STEM fields, and we need more women in leadership roles. And historically, women are actually more effective CEOs. So when you have women leading companies and organizations, um, you actually get better business outcomes. Uh, so it actually goes for governments as well. We can take a look at sort of the effect of some of the Northern European countries and their responses to the COVID pandemic have been quite good. And um, obviously, New Zealand has had a wonderful um, response and taking a look at Germany as well. So there's a lot of data to suggest having women in these leadership roles is actually a very positive thing. But I think it does start very early on. It does start in elementary grade school education, so primary, secondary education, making sure that young girls um, know that they have that as an option, um, giving role models to young girls to see that they too can be scientists and engineers and doctors and and um, mathematicians and technologists. So I think you know, we have to start really young um, and then make sure that their interest is fostered as they grow up through the primary education system. And then once you go into the field and then go into the actual professional environment, we have to make sure that we have environments which are healthy um, for women um, to feel safe and comfortable and to be able to grow and get promoted into positions of leadership. So even in my own career, um, I only started to feel um, issues when I started to go into leadership roles in terms of facing some of those systemic biases. So those are things that we all actively have to pay attention to to make sure that our female uh, colleagues feel comfortable and are able to advance in their careers. That's part of the reason why we desperately seek out the more leaders, uh, women leaders in the field and try to get you on board for some of these discussions. Uh, one last question before I let you go. Uh, there's been a tendency by elected officials in several countries to disregard expert opinion and blatant data that's available to them uh, for setting up important public policy. Uh, especially in the scientific arena. Um, how do you incentivize politicians to act scientifically uh, and demonstrate to students and youngsters that the future is not quite gloomy and uh, with regards to critical scientific work? Well, maybe my simple answer would be perhaps there should be more scientists and engineers entering political service. <laughs> they do a better job in those roles. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's the training of the engineer and the scientist to think critically, to be pragmatic, and to solve problems. And so I think those kinds of skills have to be instilled in all people moving forward because we're going to a new era of living where everyone's going to have to solve problems in their daily lives. Like even now, people who own restaurants have to come up with ways to physically change their spaces to support physical distance protocols, right? There's critical thinking and problem solving there. Um, but I do think, once again, it goes back to education. It makes sure that we have enough science and math education all the way through till people graduate. So people are like, oh, I don't like math. I'm afraid of math. Um, but I do think that um, it might require retraining of some of, the, some of the current generation. But I actually would like to see more scientists and engineers going into these um, the um, political positions. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And all of what we're seeing right now on all the press conferences is that most of the work that's being done is being done by public health professionals who are all PhDs uh, with different science background degrees, right? So we can see how that kind of training is required for all the policies going forward in this new post-pandemic era. Great, great. I mean, uh, that's a pretty hopeful uh, message that you're going to uh, ask you to leave you. Uh, we need more women scientists. We need more women leaders. If you can have more women scientist leaders like Angela Merkel, it would be perfect, yes. Um, anyway, uh, I thank you very much for participating in this one. If you have to go, uh, you'd be happy. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to shift next to uh, Dr. Balaji Venkatachari. Uh, let me give a brief outline on his background. Um, he's a senior research engineer at the National Institute of Aerospace, NIA, uh, in Hampton, Virginia. And he's a research associate at NASA's Langley Research Center. He works at the Computational Aerosciences branch there. Uh, his work there is on investigating uh, physics-based approaches to modeling turbulent transition and implementing them into uh, several CFD tools. And um, his other interests include developing the uh, space-time CESC numerical framework uh, for CFD for computing applications, and uh, which are applied to high-speed turbulent flows, 
hypersonic flows, and thermal protection system modeling. Uh, Dr. Balaji has a PhD in interdisciplinary engineering from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and uh, he's an alumnus of Pondicherry University. Um, uh, Dr. Venkatachar, if you can uh, give a brief five or 10 minute outline on what you perceive uh, as the current scenario and what you see in the future. Um, thanks, Sushil. Hope you can hear me. And yeah. hello to all my fellow panelists and the organizers for inviting me here. I think among the panelists, I think I should be honest, I have the least amount of experience probably in terms of the broadness of having spent area time in this area. I've been predominantly in academic and government lab settings. So strangely in the kind of work I've been involved in, it's like as Dr. Sengupta was pointing out, I do predominantly computational work. So for us, actually COVID has not changed things much. It's just that I don't go to office every day, but like every day I turn on my computer and I am doing my work. Nothing has stopped. In fact, I'm working more than ever because there's nowhere else to go to and there's not too many distractions around. And I think because it's computational, as long as our employer has set up the supercomputing facilities open and we can access all the software tools and the journals, we are in business, nothing has affected us. Um, some of my colleagues who do experimental work, of course, have not been able to go in to work. So that's been a setback. And luckily, usually with experiments, when the experiments is ongoing, you collect a lot of data and you don't have time to process it. And this pandemic actually has given time for a lot of them to actually consolidate their data, process them and write papers, which they've been meaning to do for a couple of years. Maybe they didn't have time to do so. Um, another thing is, also, like I think within the community, bulk of the conferences have already switched to online, just like this one. So one of the biggest conferences in our area is the AAA conference, which happens in summer and winter. And they are starting with a virtual conference starting from this year. And they hope that in the future also, they'll continue this. So this is one good thing. So a lot of times at these conferences, people from participating from India, China, or other countries, even uh, uh, poorer countries, can't often make the trip to these conferences, but now, now they don't need to do that. They can be at their desks and participate in these conferences for a lower cost. So it opens up. So this crisis actually has given us some uh, new benefits, if at all I can say that. Of course, one challenge in area of research due to this uh, social distancing is you miss the interaction or the random conversations you have with your fellow office mates, our neighbors across the room. In, at NASA, we always have these blackboard conversations over coffee, random people come and talk about something and suddenly it leads to one other idea and you write a paper or something like that. And that serendipity is actually missing right now. Online, it still doesn't work like having a random conversation or the blackboard. So that's pretty much from my end. Thanks. Okay. Oh, thanks very much for that uh, brief introduction. Um, yeah, that, that uh, water filter discussion or a uh, uh, discussion over coffee uh, more often than not gives rise to uh, excellent, I mean, germinates excellent ideas that we can use in, uh, in the future. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Bharat Gopal Swami. Uh, next, he's a distinguished senior fellow at ORF, the Observer uh, Research Foundation. Uh, for those unfamiliar with ORF, it's an independent think tank that provides input for policy and decision makers in the Indian government. Uh, and to policy and business communities all over India. Uh, it initially started out in the 90s as a, a response to dealing with the economic reform. Uh, and today, it, it essentially uh, tackles problems regarding security, strategy, uh, the environment, energy resources, economy, and uh, aspects regarding space as well. Uh, Dr. Gopal Swami is also the Vice President of Strategic Ventures at OCR Services. Uh, it's a tech firm that specializes in global trade management, uh, and sanctions compliance and e-governance. He was previously uh, leading the, um, uh, the election campaign of uh, Manish Tiwari uh, of the Indian National Congress to the Lok Sabha. Um, so he has a very diverse background in, uh, in both policy as well as uh, to, some as to some extent politics as well. Uh, prior to that, uh, he served as a director of South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council and did programs on, uh, on, uh, on defense related uh, projects on India uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. Uh, he provided regular policy inputs and counsels to uh, senior U.S. and uh, regional policymakers, uh, and forged key 
public and private partnerships and uh, regularly brief the elected representatives on the, on policy. Uh, he's also a regular contributor for print media, and he's written in foreign affairs, foreign policy, Huffington Post, and the Chicago Tribune. Uh, he is also a frequent contributor on the BBC, CNBC, and Al Jazeera, so we're pretty happy to have him here. And uh, he's even re recently authored a book titled The Final Frontier, India and uh, Space Security. Um, and uh, Dr. Bharat Gopalaswamy has a PhD in mechanical engineering from Trinity College, Dublin and a master's in space studies uh, from ISU. Um, uh, Dr. Gopal, sorry, could you give us a brief five or 10 minute introduction? Uh, I think you're muted. Could you uh, unmute your call? Yeah. Mr. Sushil, what, yeah. uh, what Sushil forgot to tell you is he and I began our journeys together in the Space Research Organization almost 20 years ago. So Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm pleased to join you all and I enjoyed all your comments listening to all of you and I just um, keeping the clock in mind. I, I want to keep my comments fairly short and I have, you know, one thing about going last is um, everything, you have nothing more to add because all of you have added the wise sentiments and the wise comments and intellectual inputs. Um, but also the good, good thing about going last is also there is, um, there are things, you know, I could pick up the crumbs around the table and then just add my pieces of um, thoughts that you might. Um, I think um, everybody has been discussing about the COVID situation and all that, you know. Um, what I want to do is just take a step behind, uh, one step behind the whole pandemic. And I think this pandemic has primarily been a catalyst um, to what was coming. Um, what we are essentially witnessing today is a fundamental and a tectonic shift in geopolitics per se. Um, the, um, and the national intelligence estimate has always pointed out to the return of great power competition. Um, the world took a different turn in 1992 when the US and um, the, the Berlin Wall came down, the um, USSR became Russia. And today, you know, the return of great power competition is between these two countries, which is essentially the, um, the United States and China. And that's a tectonic shift in geopolitics per se. The US, and, um, the US and the Soviet Union had an ideological shift in geopolitics. They were fundamentally different. There, were, um, there was no co-dependence between these two countries, but the US and China are fundamentally, the nature of the relationship is so different. It's a symbiotic relationship. There is a $800 billion um, uh, worth of trade between these two countries. These are two big, these are the number one, number two economies with a lot of co-dependence between these two countries. And if you looked at President um, um, Bush's speech, um, 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 just as he took, before he took office, it was all China, China, China until the 9-11 took place. So China was an important, you know, and many analysts and scholars and international relations theorists had predicted that uh, bin Laden and, and his friends might not live forever, but China is to stay there forever. So what you're seeing today, and you know, people like me who have worked on the Republican and the Democratic sides, we'd always supported um, about the United States taking a stronger position towards China. And this was possible in 2008. And I just wanna revisit one primary thing that was that is congruence to India and, and relevance to India is if you remember during the India-US nuclear deal in 2006 to 2008, um, President Bush could pick up the phone, call his Chinese counterpart, Hu Jintao, and allow the Indian nuclear deal to pass through the nuclear suppliers group or the board of governors at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And if you noticed three years ago, um, where you were talking about the nuclear suppliers group, the United States did not have the power to let the Chinese succumb to the United States' interest. So primarily speaking about that geopolitics, it's essentially the American power had weakened, the Chinese power had increased. The United States does not have that kind of same leverage and the power that it once had um, to, to arm, twist, or depend China. So today, the United States is in a much different position where it has to engage, socialize, integrate, as well as, uh, and, um, as well as work with China to accommodate such interests. So that's where you're seeing that fundamental shift in geopolitics. And in this, I'd, I'd 
I'd want to willingly um, respectfully disagree with my colleague who was not there, Ms. Sengupta, who has moved on. And she said that scientific collaboration has to take place. But if you look at what's happening, amidst the height of the pandemic, where this is partly a scientific issue, the United States is not able to engage on a scientific basis with China to solve the pandemic problem, which is at the end of the day, a scientific issue, but it's been deeply politicized in both these countries, as well as in other countries, where even if you see the literature in India, it's, it's characterized as a Wuhan virus or a Kung Fu virus or a virus that's originated in China to assuage each of their domestic political interests. So this is primarily a catalyst. And if you look at um, the symptoms around you, this was first, manifested itself in how the, you know, the Chinese handled Taiwan. Today, it's Hong Kong. And then the subsequent reactions to what the United States is doing, as well as all the liberal order democracies, such as the United, United Kingdom, where the passports uh, between before 1997, anybody born in Hong Kong is being recognized as a British citizen. So whatever it may be a scientific origin issue, but this was coming to a head-on competition between the US and China, one could only imagine and speculate what this, this battle is going to be between um, the US and China uh, as in terms of scientific projects or whatsoever. Now, if you put this, juxtapose this with any project like an international space station or whatsoever, or a large scientific endeavor that brings all these powers together, at the height of the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union were still able to collaborate on scientific endeavors. That's because they, the ideologies were different. Um, there was less interdependence. But I'd like to argue that there is more interdependence between these countries and there, and you see a clear fracture between liberal democracies on one hand and the authoritarian governments on the other hand, where there will not be such kind of collaboration. And a very small example for us, for you is um, the US deciding what to do with uh, the visas, revoking visas of Chinese origin students who have, any, who have had any exposure to the uh, a people liberation army in, in China and who are studying in the US, they might be sent back or those kinds of executive orders that you might be seeing. So in the short to medium term, you're going to see uh, less of a cooperation, more of a suspicion and more of a, um, um, apprehension, apprehension vis-a-vis -vis whatever Chinese origin um, scientific endeavors um, um, collaboration with the US is. So this, this also spells bad news for all the multilateral trading regimes at a very higher level. Um, the US is pulling out of the WHO. There is a fracture in the United Nations Security Council. There is a fracture in the UN. The, uh, the voting is in strictly partisan lines. So you're going to see this is bad news for multilateral regimes, but you're going to see good news for bilateral regimes vis-a-vis -vis trade regimes and vis-a-vis -vis international security regimes. Um, I think there are... Um, the second agenda, the privatization agenda, um, which is supposed to me, um, this is a domestic Indian agenda. Do you want me to go into that or I can no, just- let, let, uh, I have a follow up to what you had said right now. Uh, and this is something that I would ask uh, uh, mm -hmm. both you and uh, uh, Dr. Pandey and subsequently as well. Uh, I'll ask you first because you just finished off this, um, uh, this mm -hmm. issue regarding to some extent politiz politicization of science, how the narrative, uh, objective scientific narrative gets completely skewed depending mm -hmm. on what the politics of a particular country or a region is. So, um, I mean, the overall question is, is pretty much like this. So elected officials tend to disregard expert opinion because it, 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 it's easier for them to tweak something for political gain rather than have objective policies and, uh, and uh, initiatives. Um, how do you, how do you think we should influence and I, I don't know if you can explain to them, how do you influence political narrative so that they can have objective scientific uh, policy in mind and explain to them or convince them that this is for the general good of everyone, not just people within a state, a country, but for, for the entire world? I mean, um... I've, I've had, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've had the honor and the privilege and also the experience of working with so many elected officials. I think politics, politics is all about jobs, votes, and returning to power. And if, if a scientific opinion for that matter, you know, um, can be, it, it's all about 
communicate. Uh, science is always complex. And in my, um, and you know, in the tech world, um, simplicity is the most exquisite form of complexity. If you could digest a message to the politician to say, this is what it actually means. And this is how you, this is how you frame it to your constituent and narrative. All he needs to, a politician, for a politician, ultimately he needs to be elected by the people. And if he could convey the message to the elected representative elected people uh, for the people who elect him that this is what is good for them that's how he needs to sell a policy so the art of selling is a policy but politics is the art of selling that policy but on a on a you know if i were to start on a cynical note it would be any politics is immune to intellectual knowledge and it's insulated from intellectual knowledge and and the politicization of any intellectualism is what sometimes characterizes a certain policy. And politicians thrive on something because science is, um, sometimes science is never absolute and they thrive on the corridor of uncertainty. It's like, I, rem I vividly remember briefing a German parliamentarian on a verification system that we went for the Middle East. And I said, my, you know, your sensors could de detect blah, 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 X, Y, Z, plus or minus four dB, three dB, two decibel and all that stuff. And then, you know, after all the briefing ended, he asked me one simple question. He said, is your sensor as good as my dog is? My dog's um, characteristics are. And how do you answer such questions, right? So, um, and then, but the other end, you know, um, coming to, if, if I were to look at the Indian system, if you look at some of these things, the politicians recognize some of these things. Um, if you look at the ISRO primarily, it's bureaucratically characterized in the prime minister's office. It's not like the Department of Commerce, Department of Trade, Department of External Affairs or something. It directly reports to the prime minister. So all I'm saying is politicians are very smart enough to engage a scientific input as and when it benefits them and disregard and politicize them as it when it's inconvenient to them. And primarily, and also in the United States, if you come, you know, there was a Jason committee which was formed to assess the fidelity of the nuclear weapons vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. That was deliberately created to insulate it from the politicization of the whole um, nuclear weapons arsenal. So the Jason committee regularly briefs the Congress to say, oh, this is what the United States needs and this is how its arsenal has to be modernized and this is where it needs to be. That's why the United States hasn't, while the comprehensive test ban treaty may have been politicized in its purest form, but the United States knows where its arsenal stands vis-a-vis -vis all these testing regimes. So all I'm saying is politicians, and last but not the least, I've had a number of conversations with Dr. Kasturi Rangan, and Kasturi Rangan once, I recall a very uh, vivid conversation with him. And he said, when he was a member of parliament in the Rajya Sabha, he said, I walked out from the Rajya Sabha, I ran into Lalu Prasad Yadav, and Lalu, the, in quotes, Lalu Prasad Yadav asked Dr. Kasturi Rangan, um, told him, so Lalu Prasad Yadav knew what core competency mean. This was Dr. Kasturi Rangan's point. So meaning politicians are smart. They know at many levels what they're doing. They're happy to engage on scientific input. And as scientists and engineers, we have the responsibility to convey that scientific input to them that you know, these, if you take these account of scientific input, a collective good is always better than an individual best. So you try and find a way to sell it to your constituency that this is the right thing for you to do in the broader interest of the country than for your narrow interest in selling this to your constituency and winning your votes. In a way, would it help if more scientists get into politics? It always helps, right? So it's the more scientists get into politics, the less for the, you know, uh, but, um, the less for um, the less for more informed opinion. Yeah. Fair enough, uh, Doctor Espandia. I mean, uh, we just got the perspective of a, a, a policy wonk. Uh, he had a more cynical take uh, on uh, on how to influence and what he sees the political class as. You've interacted with them uh, in different uh, leadership levels from a scientist perspective. Um, how do you see the situation right now compared to say? Uh, at the start of your career uh, at ISRO, uh, when it comes to interacting with politicians and how to influence policy, uh, there are a few things that ISRO would like to do. How do you convince the politicians to say this is in the better interest of the overall nation, uh, even though the, the cost benefit might, might not be apparent immediately? 
uh, but it is in uh, in the national interest. Uh, how do you communicate with politicians in that level? Uh, sir, I think your call is muted. Sorry. Yeah, okay. See, also a lot of people are aware that the political system is there. The various work of uh, people are sitting at the different levels. So they right from the um, Prime Minister office to different level. But what all that the scientists need to do is, if you look at under, see, recall what uh, Israel has been doing for the last so many years, right? starting from the Vikram Sarabhai to present uh, leadership. We, we take part way the scientific effort will benefit the nation. We must ensure that we must put it down, put it in a language which they can understand. See, as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bharat told, the Prime Minister office is many bureaucrats are there. It is our responsibility to go to them and convince them they what way the each and every program of the, for example, space, how it is benefiting the common man, how it is benefiting the strategic aspects of the country, how it benefits the various walk of life. So that way, we see right from the beginning, uh, as far as ISRO is concerned, we have been convincing the top uh, politicians, whoever comes there, and we have been getting whatever ISRO need to do it for the nation, and we have been getting, and I'm sure that in the future, we will continue to get, even in the pandemic uh, scenario, I'm sure that the government will support because of the the end use of the our scientific uh, effort is very, very visible to them. So it is our responsibility to convince them that what way it is reaching the common man. So that way I don't see any issue. I think that's one of the success stories, I think, as far as this is concerned. They've been able to communicate and influence the, the political uh, uh, arrangement in the country to get most of what they wanted uh, from the government uh, with modifying the narrative such that the politicians are able to understand and support the uh, the projects. Uh, uh, one additional question, uh, recently the, uh, the government had decided to privatize uh, a significant part of the space sector. Uh, do you have an opinion on what the government got right with respect to that? Uh, what do you think requires more deliberation in that particular field? Um, does it make sense to uh, privatize uh, missions like interplanetary missions right now, even though the government ISRO itself does not have a tried and tested technology for, uh, say, sending probes to Mars or other planets. Um, how do you how do you balance that with? I think last year there was an initiative to set up a launch pad in Tuthukuri for uh, the small scale launch vehicles. Um, what do you make sense of the of the privatization uh, focus right now? See, look, uh, this uh, space is growing and demand from common man is increasing. Strategy, strategy sector demands a lot of things and ISRO alone cannot meet this whole need. So it is high time to privatize. In fact, the, whatever you have mentioned that the interplanetary mission, the payload, what need to be carried, what need to be done, that kind of thing has to come from the scientific community and private partners also. So... And even in our own ISRO contest, uh, we wanted to give the whole PSLV to be productionized and launched from Sierra Kota by private pros. And in fact, uh, the, there are consortium of people coming forward to do this, and we are hand in hand working with the industrial partners. Actually, it is high time to inject competent private parties who can shoulder these responsibilities. And I, we, ISRO is with them to uh, put hand, I mean, uh, to help them. I am sure that in the years to come, the prioritization of certain aspects of the space activities definitely will, is required. As uh, the interplanetary space uh, mission is one such a thing where they can use PSLV or down the line uh, GSLV or GSLV Mark 3. They can make use of it and we are with them to help them. And it is essential. You look at the kind of demand what is required now in the pandemic uh, scenario. So all are going for e classes. We need to support them. We need to have more communication satellite, which is essential to go with the ISRO alone. Cannot do all this uh, full, cannot meet the requirement. In my view, 
is high time to enter into privatization and uh, slowly get into that and uh, make make sure that uh, private partners are getting benefit out of this and uh, for, because of that the, we can be able to meet the common man need absolutely i mean uh, especially considering the demand for uh, several agency several uh, demands from universities even uh, private yeah. sector for several satellite launches which yes, is why yes. it made a lot of sense to set up the sslv launch pad in uh, tutukuri and then have that as a completely private operation yeah, but yeah. i was very curious to see things like interplanetary mission that takes a lot more effort than just launching a satellite up into either the low earth orbit or even above uh, should we make should we make that distinction between certain aspects should be privatized and cer certain aspects should just be left to the government right now and not let out to the private parties yet no there are some strategic uh, sector we have to retain uh, hard for competence and there are certain aspect that's as i told this uh, the so we are use pslv to go to mars right. if pslv is getting protect, uh, productionized in the private sector and they very well can take it to mars and beyond so that way they, they, there are certain strategic sector which need to be retained by the government or isro or the rdo as other aspects where the interplanetary thing is more of scientific uh, aspect the hardcore uh, basic science we need to explore and uh, those aspect definitely uh, we can privatize it privatize it and the uh, launch vehicle per se for example can be used now the pslv or the down the line gslv in fact now private parties are building satellite for us all right. satellite is built by private parties india is growing to that extent and i think we must capitalize on it and uh, uh, make use of the scenario and uh, make sure that uh, by this process the whole nation is getting benefited while you were uh, uh, the director at sdsc did you happen to see industry interest in the launch area from private parties I mean, we've always seen as you said uh, satellites being manufactured by universities and private sector what about the launch sector like uh, were private parties willing to participate or did they show interest in setting up rocket yeah. technology you are right actually the uh, though uh satellite whole satellite is built by private parties in the case of launch vehicle this whole rocket is not built but there are many many systems right major hardwares are built by private parties like alnt gotrej hil all those people and definitely they need to have a little more uh, uh, hand holding because certain aspect is with isro we are opening all shar facility for the privatization to make private parties to make use of it to launch pslv or down the line other launch vehicles thanks there are um, there are consortium people are coming forward and i think uh, at one particular point nearly 80% of pslv's launch facility uh, the, the rocket was i think part of the components were manufactured outside but assembled and essentially set up at uh, at uh, shar yeah um, yeah right. yeah um the other thing that i asked uh, dr sengupta and uh, dr gopala swami in uh, we decided to see particularly as a, a after effect of this pandemic all the countries are changing their focus to go indigenous and not necessarily uh, depend on other countries for their technology for a series of uh, aspects uh, do you think that we already have enough uh, the technology uh, base for privatizing a lot of these launches uh, for example do we already have that or what i'm trying to ask is if we privatize today would we be able to see launches say 2 years or 3 years from now or is there going to be a significant development period of say 10 years from now after which we'll see uh, a private launch oh uh, sorry this is for you again sir dr pandian yeah i think it is maybe the in 2 to 3 years time frame it is possible to do it because if you take the major hardware you know it is all built by the lnt gotrej and uh, hil and now they are forming consortium to do the same thing so from that point of view i don't see any bottlenecks i think i don't think it is like a 10 years time maybe 2 uh, to 3 years time frame is a reasonable time frame for uh, uh completely taking over pslv by private parties and launching it and continue the continue to have the same heritage as what uh, pslv is uh, achieving now i see okay all right uh i have a question for dr venkatacharya right now uh i mean we've been talking about 
uh, the policy aspect of it and the political side of it and the government and research side of it. You work at an institution which is on the nexus of government research, there's a certain academic aspect of it and a private institute as well. Uh, where do you see the research focus for uh, places like NIA changing over the next six months, say a year or five years from now? Since we are actually, we are in a, actually, NIA is a kind of strange organization. We, we are like a trifecta of universities catering uh, to predominantly NASA Langley, mm -hmm. but we also have customers as Airbus, FAA, and we also do outreach. But I would say 70 to 80% of it essentially caters to government research or government funded research, either coming through universities or coming directly through NASA to us. So in that regards, I think the funding scenario may not be too drastically different because often these funding cycles are based on long-term goals. So they have a certain lead time in mind and they start funding towards that. Of course, if the Congress doesn't pass the budget and for some reason they'll have to remove some extra quota, then these fundings can be taken away, but usually it doesn't happen. So these are long funding cycles usually you're guaranteed for three to four years and more fundamental nature in nature so that it doesn't vary too much with some new pandemic or anything like that. So in that regards, I don't see as much a change, but often, even though our funding levels may not change, often the milestones of the project can be tinkered around it with it. Like for example, like I say, like I think some of the focus for aeronautical research might switch now because with these big planes being retired, for example, Airbus has said that they're not going to no longer manufacture A380, things like that. So you might again go back to focus like uh, single aisle kind of vehicles and stuff like that. So to make them more efficient and to meet the new environmental regulations and so on, now the focus suddenly might switch to smaller planes which might need a completely different paradigm in terms of design and things like that. So the funding might change its position slightly, but these are all like minor changes compared to things like, I mean, these are always in the pipeline. It's just that one might get pushed higher on priority and one might get pushed lower on priority and things like that. But as in a big scale, it may not change much. Of course, the funding coming from private industries to us, that might take a hit. For example, Armas might decide that they are better focused on like doing, uh, taking care of the manufacturing side of aspects and things like that and not so much on fundamental research. So that funding might come down, but even within the US, the funding from private industries is still a small part compared to government funded research, especially in an area like space and aer aeronautics. So there we may not see too much of a shift. So right now, like if, if some were, someone were a scientist in a private research lab, for example, um, how do you think they should like retool their skill sets to uh, to the changing dynamic of, say, funding situation, for example? Could you see more funding from biomedical firms and, uh, say, epidemiology-related research? So um, there'd be more uh, jobs available in data analysis, for example. How do you? How do you see people changing their skill sets to the changing dynamic of industry and the government as well? I mean, as a, as a researcher yourself, you're quite aware that like the only constant is change, right? <laughs> and within research, I mean, we dwell on uh, changing directions all the time. We, we actually, we like that. We like the curiosity aspect that often takes us in different directions. And, and it's important to keep changing as well. Keep changing because it's not to change for change sake, but often by slightly taking detours, you learn a lot more. Like you get a different perspective on your own research. So from that end, we, I think most research have always, at least coming from academic background, you see professors always writing uh, proposal grants to different agencies involving different collaborations. So that, that always has to happen. And in an era like, for example, say aerospace right now, right? In in the last two to three years, the number of papers that have been published on machine learning as applied to aerospace has gone up tremendously. Machine learning as an area has always, has been in existence for like maybe 30 years, 40 years, neural networks has been in existence. 
it's just that it needed the go program to make that breakthrough and defeat that go champion and then from go it morphed into alpha go and and even though it is still only proven in very uh, limited areas people have already seen that hey this is something which i can benefit from and maybe like we are right now in an era where this might take off so suddenly now everybody has jumped on to it i mean as an engineer i have never i mean like as an at least as a cfd guy i have never dwelt too much on neural networks and how it might benefit me but now i am forced to look into it forced to learn into what pytorch or any of these tensor flow algorithms can do for me get to know the nitty gritties and see how i can start tinkering with it so we are constantly retooling ourselves to even survive is there a message in that for faculty and educators in this line rather than just focus on one particular line of teaching i mean that's focus. that's been at least like when i was doing my undergraduate in india that has been the major restriction right i mean right. we are like i went to mechanical engineering school so i was pretty much in the first year of college i did take courses in physics and chemistry and everything but after that i was just hunkered down in my department and didn't, yeah. didn't even actually have so much of a cross pollination between some of the other branches whereas now like you know that i mean that's why actually in india you need more like a university setting rather than an engineering school setting where you are only talking to engineers you need to be talking with humanities you need to be talking with doctors you need to be talking to chemists that way you kind of see uh, flow of ideas across disciplines and also probably you i mean the future is all about multidisciplinary collaborations i mean right now any big grants coming from say the dod or doe within the us always needs at least five different pi's coming from different universities with different backgrounds trying to put together a big package so that as a overall you can deliver something a simple example would be something like say the supersonic aircraft which people are trying to design now i mean concorde has been retired for a while the biggest hurdle in supersonic flights was not the capable the design cap- scientific aspect itself so it's more to do with humanities convincing people that this is not too loud that you're going to be disturbed or it's not going to kill fishes or it's not going to kill the birds and things like that so a bulk of the scientific uh, or the money for these grants actually went into doing humanity studies psychology studies of people how they'll react to these things rather than the aspect of just flying at supersonic speeds so for that then you need to tap into other communities to get a more holistic view so so that also actually um, makes the case for having these collaborative or multidisciplinary research aspects and i, I think see. that's go on. Go on. that's one aspect where india or even like japan for that matter has been very rigid in its uh, old ideas they haven't embraced the challenge of collaborating across or spreading the way i see that happening here is when people come out of colleges and academic institutions because of the lack of availability of employment in that particular sector they start to diversify after getting out rather than be trained within an academic environment where they can develop skill sets in biology fluids or whatever it is that they want to learn uh, but they are forced to do that training outside of that proper framework which i don't know if it is a very productive environment at all i don't know if the quality of someone who comes out and learns independently would be uh, the same quality as an environment where they are able to learn and are exposed to multiple envi- uh, multiple streams of study uh, within a, uh, a more curated set up i mean that i mean the point you brought up actually makes like for example the current scenario with covid i think uh, people might have read read in news about the nasa jpl lab coming up with a ventilator right i mean to think of it ventilators it's like you know it's like essentially artificial lung kind of thing right so it's, we think it's easy for engineers maybe nasa rocket scientists it should be pretty easy that they should be doable but then what apparently they did the chief engineer who designed it actually said it was a uh, like a kind of uh, uh, light bulb moment for him because he realized all the things you knew in rocket science doesn't apply to these things because these are such low speed flows and which we are often not dealing with quite often so they had to go talk to the doctors and then the technicians who operate them to kind of understand how to even do these things 
So it was pretty much like back to school for them. But then they did, like once they saw the angle and then putting all their experiences together, they could quickly come up with that. So having these kind of experience as part of your training in undergrad makes you uh, more agile. I mean, agile is IT world always talks about agile uh, technologies and things like that. But for every engineer, that's important too. I think humanities training will also instill a sense of humility as well. I, I have not just a personal opinion. Uh, since, uh, okay, this is an interesting question for you, uh, especially since you're an expat in the research area who's living uh, elsewhere. Now, India has a huge uh, talent pool uh, with expert capabilities uh, living abroad. And uh, right now, a number of nationalistic policies by governments in the US and the UK and several other countries are kind of going very um, focused on hiring people within their own countries and not foreign nationals. And so we're going to see, I guess at some particular point, uh, a reverse migration of people with a lot of talent coming back to places like India, to China has already been doing that for the last 15 years. Uh, how do you see the government adjusting itself for this kind of a talent bonanza? You suddenly have people coming in with a lot of computer science and IT expertise, even engineering, medicine, whatever the expertise are. We don't essentially have the infrastructure or the policy narrative to get them and keep them employed uh, rather than then come back and then go elsewhere once again. What do you think should the government and the policymakers think about, uh, say, if you were to come back, say, five years from now, what would you look at in the government um, uh, policy-wise so that the, would attract you? I think the first thing, like, essentially is, like, rather than, like, me making a full-scale move back, if I had the opportunity to, say, come every summer, start working, collaborating with some universities or national labs, spend a few months here interacting with the students and all that. It'll make it easier for people like who have gone away from the system to get re-familiarized with the system and get their feet wet in like knowing the circles. I mean, in research community, it's always about knowing your program manager. It's about knowing who to collaborate with and so on and so forth. The scientific aspect is easier of the collaboration, but then you need money to do scientific research and in a, when you move to any new country or new city or new university, then you need to know the who, who uh, the big people who you have to know so that you can facilitate this. And having something like a summer fellowship, inviting these people to come for the next few years slowly might actually whet their appetite to even moving full scale back. From the policy end, I think what we need to see is like, India has done actually a good job in opening up a lot of new fellowships for people willing to come back. They even have, often even go to come to, at least in the US, they come every six months to come and recruit in big cities and so on and so forth. But these recruitments are often to institutes, say even the IITs, where, which are predominantly undergraduate teaching institutes, not as per say a full-blown scientific research university or something like that. So the incentive then trickles down, it or reduces. So we need to have world-class like research facilities across. It's not enough you have a few, elevate the few NITs, IITs or something like that, that still only serves the undergrads who are eventually going to not even stay within India probably for that matter. So or go like and a, work. So places like GNC, ASR, uh, the yes. Jawala, if they come out and recruit people, that would be more attractive for some. More attractive. And I think like what now, like even within like a lot of these private universities have you know expanded. These should also like, like push the governments to allow them to recruit people. It shouldn't be like, okay, somebody always wants to go to IASC. You should go to some tier one university too, because their research can happen too. I mean, in, in the US, that's one thing they've always done. Even in minority undergraduate institutions, they make sure that the faculty are involved in at least some small fraction of research and expose their students to research. It doesn't matter whether they're in a poor neighborhood or in a very small state, they always get tagged down to be part of bigger proposals and you get benefits to be involved in such things. So, I mean, a lot of people would be happy to move to a smaller town and have the luxury of living in big houses and so on and so forth, not fight with the crowds within the cities. But to have that, we need to have a healthy ecosystem that will allow you to do this. We need to advertise more of these facilities and also like somehow break the misinformation campaign that says like bureaucracy is still a dominant picture. So people are hesitant to 
deal with that aspect so if you can kind of clearly show that and these summer programs actually would help you do that you will get a feel for what is happening and you'll know that hey this is not the india i left 5 years back 10 years back or this is not the academic setting i was used to and things have changed and eventually people will move back i think and that's what you, china had, yeah. once you said china, something that's like that it, it have an avalanche effect and more people will start exactly. to come back and I think China that's what they did with their 5000 scholars program or something mm-hmm. like essentially a, like they of course they invited the top 5000 scholars of what they considered and gave them a good fellowship come every summer and teach in a, and teach and do research in a university we can essentially take a leaf out of that book and do that yeah i think yeah i think what you said would be very useful for both the policy makers uh, here as well as Uh, researchers and students who are say in the uk or in the us or elsewhere who are looking forward to coming back uh, at some particular point yeah i mean i would like to add one more thing it's usually yeah. the researchers are not there for the money so true, it's not true. it doesn't take too much to convince them to move yeah, so it's like freedom. all you need to show is like you have a healthy environment feeding yeah. doing research then people move there right. um, very true very very true um okay so i have one last question for uh, all three panelists remaining over here and uh, Uh, this is something to do with isro predominantly uh, especially after all the privatization um, uh, moves that have happened recently like what do you see would be the role and the purpose of isro in the coming years and coming decades while you are answering right now just finish off and then i can go to uh, bharat and then finish off the dr mandir well isro is like a great vehicle for motivating you know youngsters or the the general public like as dr pandian was saying it's easier to show that like or the kind of the politicians that hey this directly like benefits the common people it's a good vehicle in fact i would say it is more like a poster child for like on which fundamental science can cling on to or like it's like a mother ship because fundamental science is less sexy it's not easier to like you know convince people that hey this is something good this is going to take 60 70 80 years to mature but trust me this is going to benefit you and people are not convinced with those kind of aspects whereas more like an see, N- more like an nsf kind of a role in the future role i mean those kind of researches essentially yeah, national science I mean, foundation kind national of national science something like that whereas like something like any space program has a bigger visibility on that front i mean you see and it's more immediate i mean the pack, the payload they might carry may not convince you like as you were asking what how do you hold again from like looking at the moon of mars right it's not very evident to a common lay person who's trying to get food and things like that but still it's it's a still a very good uh, uh, platform to like you know instill the uh, like inspire people or like even have a fantasy mm-hmm. like like it's it's always nice to see that hey i will be some day be able to fly to moon or fly to mars i may not afford it but like the possibility is always engaging and that gives you hope and to cling on so from that aspect it shows very important and the other aspect is because it's i mean it's been established now it's like we were celebrating satish dhawan's 100th centenary birthday right so in the sense like it 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 has a longer tenure in terms of how a research establishment should come into picture or how to establish itself and it can have valuable ideas for smaller research agencies to benefit from insights or some uh, gyan they might have accumulated over the years on how to put a very successful research agency from that angle also i think it would be very useful at least that's what i see it as uh but what do you think about the role of this role in the coming years decades maybe you know um it's raw of course obviously has had a key role to play in the last um four or five decades i think there are three main for me three main um lessons or um roles that the that isro has played and will still continue to play and i think my colleague dr pandian alluded to this and saying he he kept repeating um for us it's to convince the politicians about what isro has actively contributed and if i were to frame it and look back at um one of the statements that was made by um dr satish tawan when isro was in its infancy was essentially how technology could be applied to the development goals of india as it pertained in 1970s and those goals still remain 
to the Indian public because ISRO is predominantly funded by the Indian taxpayer. So time and again, um, the Indian taxpayer has to be reminded why ISRO is such an important organization. And there are two main areas where uh, remote sensing and telecommunications besides the scientific endeavors and scientific exploration that it has done. India has a huge population. So it's connected the millions of people that it houses. And India's unique geography and is somebody is a country which is predominantly affected uh, by natural disasters. It's a country that's prone to natural disaster. ISRO is one of the first countries to do teleeducation and applications like telemedicine. So these goals predominantly will um, continue to say that. So which means what I'm telling you is essentially um, ISRO's role will be in the developmental goals of the nation. It is one of the premier scientific organization that's largely devoted to um, um, devoting its scientific expertise and skills into the developing nations. The second most important uh, goal that's been um, under, under missed and underreported and uh, understudied is how ISRO is a beautiful business case. This is a high technology that a developing nation in the 1960s that was relatively poor that successfully adopted, 40 years later, it is, it is on par excellence and it is counted as one of the success stories in space technology vis-a-vis as, well, as far as the developed world is concerned. So you talk of ISRO today in parity with much of the most developed uh, space faring nations in the world. So how did ISRO come about from somebody who had no money to build a self-sustaining space environment and this is a beautiful business case that could be studied about three phases of this row from where it learned to the first phase was um, learning by adopting foreign scientific systems. The next phase is learning those systems and building those systems themselves. And the third, case, third phase is um, achieving that self-reliance. And now I would even portray the fourth phase as I said, from a technology importer to a technology exporter. So much of for not only for India, but for the uh, India's surrounding neighborhood and much of the other countries um, in the OECD. The global South. Yeah, the global yeah, South. Yeah, global well. South. I don't want to put that in very political terms, but I wanted to put it in very um, uh, parity terms as how you become from a technology importer to a technology exporter. That is the second case. The third case is ISRO's, um, from a foreign policy perspective, India's India's foreign policy has always been very, um, what I would call it as a very collaborative, engaging, you know, by far, um, you know, for lack of a better word, it's a non-alignment movement what, whatsoever. It's always one of the few cases where you've had a scientific collaboration healthy with, with the Russians as well as with NASA on a scientific level. So you have, you know, it's a non-alignment case. And today you have a SARC satellite, you know, despite all your neighborhood disagreements, you have used scientific technology for building bridges across your most difficult and sensitive neighborhoods. So I think these are three main areas that I think ISRO can teach the world in terms of how do you promote soft power? Just as Bollywood is so famous all across the world, I think ISRO is a famous story that is under told and under reported in the rest of the world as well. So I think these are three main areas where I think ISRO will, be, ISRO will continue to be a mainstay of the Indian story. I think it's an Indian success story that's been largely underreported and under told. Thanks. Uh, and Dr. Vani, what do you see as the role and purpose from someone who's been an administrator there for a long time? Uh, where do you see, say, ISRO five years from now, 10 years from now, or maybe even 50 years from now? Oh, sorry, sorry. I think you're uh, muted again. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, first let me thank uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bharat Kobalsami and uh, Sri Balaji. I think they have very nicely summarized the role of uh, ISRO for the next uh, couple of uh, decades. What I would feel is, even if it is privatized, ISRO will continue to play a very key role in the cutting edge technology. If you look at this common man needs, keep on increasing in using the high end technologies. And if this kind of pandemic uh, no, situation, as you know, in Kerala, now we all schools and colleges, they are starting e-classes. Already they started, but now right from LKG to onwards, they are going to do the e-classes and other things. How do you provide this kind of infrastructure through space? So definitely is a huge demand is emerging. And I am sure that in the tele-education and telemedicine, this kind of uh, pandemic scenario is very, very effectively placed. And uh, I am sure the common man need is going to increase in using the common, I mean, high-end technology. 
we is in isro we are ready to serve the nation by providing all the high end technologies to common man even if you take the railway crossing or fisherman where he has to fish it all those things we are able to link our uh, uh, technology to common man need so it is continue to be there continue to serve the country in all the aspects of the using the technology i am sure that uh, isro has got a very bright future in the coming years and also with privatization and a lot of interest in both launch vehicles as well as satellites can yeah. also be a guiding hand for private parties so that they can uh, like progress faster rather than start to reinvent the wheel uh, per se for many of these situations as well yeah yeah this once it is still the transition will always take time once the transition to privatization of the car certain things happening and uh, the one city is smooth and the transition phase is over definitely things can go fast so the government or the common man side the utility point of view you have to define a bit long term goals to the private sector so that they can fund it for their infrastructure right now that the part of it uh, need to be strengthened and reinforced so that uh, private parties can come forward and take it and uh, do the things in a fast track way definitely the transition is one thing but later on i am sure that it will benefit the country great uh, i have one small request to all three panelists i have so a lot of the uh, audience for these panel discussions are students uh, in final year students and pre final year students many of them are young professionals who are starting their careers as well uh, particularly because of the uncertainty uh, around this pandemic situation right now could you say like a sentence or two on what your message would be uh, so that they can uh, look forward to say 6 months from now 1 year from now how do they how do they tackle all the complexities and uncertainties and uh, in in the situation right now i'll go from balaji then bharat and i'll finish off with uh, dr pandian that's okay i actually sushil i just wanted to add one more comment on the isro thing no, i thought more important aspect was like i think we all remember the pictures from the control room of mangalyaan yeah the image of all the women engineers and scientists in that screen actually like it inspired more it's not only in india across the globe i think it inspired a lot of girls to take up engineering and science and see it very attractive so isro set a great model in like advertising that aspect too and that's very important i think you posted this question to dr sen gupta as well that's right yeah about women in stem field so isro set a great uh, example in that regards as and, for the and question more often than not educating women is the fastest way of getting the society out of poverty and and uh, strife absolutely yeah. and as regarding the question for the students or even young think, professionals or even young professionals it's like i mean i know this is at least as a cricket playing nation this is a very trite statement like life is not a te- not life is not an ipl match and it's a test match and you have to be there for the long haul so i mean just like in even in investing the philosophy is never look at short term things and make decisions look have a long term vision and march towards that along the way you might stutter and stumble into different detours but trust i mean i i shouldn't say trust me because i've been only like i'm 40 years old so i don't have too much of an experience but those detours will give you the most important lessons in your life and when you look back later those would be the most important changes in your life and so and the other thing to have is have confidence in yourself the area we've chosen for example aerospace you have heard from all the panelists that this is definitely the future this is an area that's going to be of very utmost importance for the next hundreds of years we need to be able to go to colonize uh, other planets and so on and so forth so we are there for the long haul and this is a very challenging field and the skills you learn in this field is going to serve you no matter what whether you decide to go into it whether you go into banking or you're going to go into policy making the the skill set you developed in learning these courses and learning through this working through these in this area will serve you very well and i think i think you are of the same generation as me like when we were graduating it was the same kind of crisis it was the september 911 happened a lot of plans went disarray i i know i had a job and i couldn't get a job and they they rescinded the offer so i couldn't go and that kicked me into advancing my 
post graduation efforts so like looking back 20 years from now i mean like 20 years from then like i got to go work with nasa be at nasa langley research center which is the first nasa center and so on i never even imagined those that that crisis would have spawned this response so don't look at too pessimistically have a very optimistic long term vision and stick to it i think just sticking to plan sometimes has great benefits that's what i would say great thanks thanks what do you have a message for youngsters who are watching this well i mean i think you know uh, um even policy so, wonks who want to, even people youngsters who want to get into public policy uh, and uh, politics as well yeah of all places you know i just want to revisit china again as the whole chinese saying goes every crisis is an opportunity right um um i mean you know yeah you are in the midst of a pandemic we do not know i think i want to revisit some of those points it's essentially you are in the midst of a pandemic so you do not it's very hard to predict um because we still do not have the accurate picture not the entire data what this pandemic means how it is the financial world is still evolving if you look at the stock markets they have bounced back the stock market is always looking at the future so nobody has a clear indication that are hiring freezes across big companies in the world but you know just because there are hiring freezes there are also um careers you know like um, my colleague just mentioned 15 years ago 911 happened then you know but there was also not social media and the advent of facebook no twitter no kind of messaging democratization of information and the carry of carry forward of information in such a way so the youngsters today have much more career opportunities than just um sticking to the traditional opportunities so to speak they could um it's all about how you the information that you have and in in the intelligence world we say something knowing some you know knowing having intelligence is one thing and realizing that you have intelligence is a completely different thing so knowing what skills you have realizing what you could do with those skills is a totally set of different issues and with the markets that that are prevalent today i think the world is um the world could be their oyster and they could make best use of what they have so I, if i were them i'd be just looking at oh um why am i not born 20 years later and why was i born 20 years ago this was a much better world for me to be in they can shape the world and that's what leadership is all about about seizing the opportunity making best of that opportunity and seizing um, can i be the leader in this world and i think um they have they have a phenomenal road ahead and that's what i, I want them to see through this I just don't stick to yeah sticking to plan but also improvising on the plan and making the best use of and if if a, if a road is blocked then use the detour and you can get to your destination wherever you want to be and that you will have a rich life and richness doesn't mean only in one sense it's a variety of experiences that come for that richness excellent i think uh, i think all three of us are from the same generation so having some level of dynamism and uh, compat not compatibility but some way where you can adjust the with adaptability that's the right word yeah adaptability in adjusting to what we just do you know they even if donald trump he just goes he doesn't play to the script he just adapts to the situation and wins votes absolutely absolutely uh, dr pandian do you have a message for uh, students and young professionals who are watching this right now yeah i think um, i think they need not uh, dis- get disheartened i am seeing that a very challenging future is there i think most of them they should um, become a job provider rather than job seekers now if you look at in india there are many startup who are coming up and they are all uh, doing very fast things even the, they are designing the launch vehicle they are building satellite private i mean the startups are coming up and uh, all corners they are getting support and the i think they should uh, make sure that uh, they are uh, Uh, i mean in fact the environment is very conducive for this uh, startup and they should just go for that kind of thing and quickly align themselves and adopt themselves as uh, mr gome uh, kovar sami told adopt themselves to the changing scenario uh, future is very bright and let me wish them all the best so oh, thank you very much sir uh, i think it, you are 10 minutes over the uh, schedule end of the panel discussion i'm quickly checking if there's any uh, yeah. question uh, important so question i think you can go with our chat there is few questions posted by our uh, participants inside zoom and okay. a few we have taken from youtube and we have given i think uh, now audience can uh, also i think they can give their question in the zoom uh, 
yeah, while I look at that, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists, uh, Dr. Pandian, Dr. Sen Gupta, who had to leave early, uh, Dr. Venkaracharya, and Dr. Gopalaswamy, particularly those who dialed in from the US because of the time zone difference. I think it's what, 3.40 or almost 3 o'clock in the morning for them. They've been very patient uh, and uh, very enthusiastic in, uh, in giving a lot of uh, answers to, uh, to all the questions that were put up. Um, just looking at some of the questions, what are the opportunities? Um, I think these are fine. Not sure if these will be useful for uh, query to how to execute uh, the trajectory to start an aerospace startup. Okay, so I think we've addressed most of these questions in the uh, uh, in the panel discussions already. Uh, since we're already ten minutes beyond the uh, end time, I think I'll probably uh, I'll decide to end this panel discussion. Again, I thank all the panelists for participating in this one. And uh, please hold on. Uh, there are two more panel discussions that are lined up. Uh, one which involves people from industry. Uh, they'll give perspective on uh, the situation that they are seeing, as well as some uh, some opinion on the economic side of it. And uh, later on in the evening, we also have another discussion um, with panelists from uh, academia. So um, yeah, thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Sushil, for the excellent job of all those questions and things like that. Very okay. nice, you moderator. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, Sushil and all the panelists. I think uh, I think uh, all the Indians are re back in this uh, uh, panelists. I can say Balaji, Bharat, and Anita as well as our audience, sir. So it was well. I think uh, they have uh, given lots of uh, ideas and suggestions. And uh, on the post-COVID-19, also like the overall, the glimpse about space and defense program. Uh, definitely, I think uh, we can even minute and we can able to, through IEA and IEEE, we can even send it to the respective uh, uh, policy makers. So from the narrated points. So thank you so much for uh, all the, the panelists of our uh, uh, first session. So I think it is an international online conference uh, uh, on the challenges and opportunity on especially on aeronautics, astronautics, and aviation. Uh, it is organized by Institute of Engineers, Tamil Nadu State Center, and IAAA uh, of India. So uh, it's almost, I think, uh, we are on time. Uh, may not be like, I think, uh, another 15 minutes, we are uh, 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 much faster. So we have uh, almost 120. I think uh, the second uh, panel and uh, the third panel will be starting up. So I request all the participants and audience delegates who are in uh, Zoom as well as in uh, social medias of YouTube channel and Facebook, everybody can be back around 1.15. Uh, so we have an interesting session from uh, four uh, the panelists of uh, industry. So they are going to talk about the aerospace industry, especially we have uh, uh, Praveen PA, Dhamodran, and uh, Mundi Ratnam and uh, the other panelists of uh, Java, I think uh, one more panelist, yeah, sorry. So they're going to be joining around uh, 120. So hope so. I think uh, that's the industry panelist. So from here, research and academic, how the industry is going to take up uh, the uh, ideas from both of them. And uh, we have uh, uh, well uh, versed profiles are there. So we'll be back. I think uh, now, I think anyhow, the Zoom and YouTube will be lined up with a few videos. So people can watch in their home, having their lunch, and we'll be back by 1.30 sharp. Thank you so much for all of them to join. Okay, let me once again uh, compliment and congratulate the organizers for the excellent task being carried out. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So, Bala, can you, I think uh, we can post the video. I think uh, this Zoom will be live. I think people can uh, go back and come. Otherwise, they can also view in this. So, they, can, they need not to leave. Volume, I think we can Volume is not there. Can you increase the volume, uh, uh, Dr. Balamurthy? Makes crumbs. You need them on Earth, the crumbs fall down to the ground. But here, crumbs are just going to float away. On the other hand, the tortillas that we use are uh, heat treated and specially packaged in an oxygen-free environment to prevent mold from growing. They're packed in packages like this. And thanks to that process, a tortilla like this can be good for 18 months. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up our tortilla. We're gonna get
get our peanut butter, squirt it on the tortilla, get our honey, squirt it on there, and we will have peanut butter honey sandwich in space. Open up the tortilla, and voila, a weightless tortilla. Okay, we got one tortilla. Whoa, run away. Take my uh, peanut butter, open it up. Mm, can't rip it. Fortunately, we have space scissors. They're attached by a tether so they don't go floating out. Take the scissors and open the peanut butter punch. Peanut butter is open. Squeeze it onto the tortilla carefully. And now a little honey. And I noticed something cool about the honey. Instead of the bubble sitting at the top, because there's no gravity to make it float up, the bubble is floating in the middle. Okay, all closed up. And the envelope of peanut butter and honey is ready to eat. Not too bad. Last piece of my sandwich. It was pretty delicious. Well, my hands are all sticky. Right all now. We don't have a sink. We don't have running water. You gotta wash yourself up some other way. All cleaned up. Nice and hygienic on the space station. This goes in the trash. Lunch is over. Delicious. Things in space look a whole lot cooler than here on Earth. Welcome back, guys. Today's video is on the top five amazing space experiments. How do you wash your hands with soap and water in space? Number five. Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield experiments with a new pack of hand washing solution and demonstrates how to properly wash your hands in space. It is no rinse body bath. No rinse body bath, and it's a bag with a straw. So now let's demonstrate. Okay, it's time to get clean. I'm going to squirt some water out. So we have a big ball of water, and you put it on your hand. And now I've got water floating around on my hand. And so I wash my hands up with that. And then grab a towel. And dry them off. So that's how we do it. We use no rinse. It's a special type of slightly soapy water, so you don't need to have a, a bunch of fresh water afterwards. You squirt it. You float a ball of water in front of yourself. And then you just dry your towel. And when you're done, we just tuck our towel somewhere to let it air dry so that the evaporated water gets back into the space station and we can use that water again. So it works pretty well. Sort of like, um, maybe sort of like if you were on a sailboat and you needed to get clean, you do it sort of the same way. Number four, an astronaut experiments with water physics in a weightless environment. It's really trippy to see how the water reacts. Wow. Cool. Wow, I just love those hot sauces. There we go. We'll switch it to a black background. Yeah, so that's about 800 mils. So there should put it around 1100 milliliters. Let's see what happens here. Just one of these jaw dropping moments. Okay, here we go. Let's do it again. Looking into the camera. Big pop. Here we go. Oh, right at the lead. I saved the lens. What I'm planning to do is after this whole series of experiments, I'll suck all this water up with the syringe, I'll put it back in bags, and I'll use it to make tea with, so I'll end up drinking my experiment. You gotta conserve your resources when you're in a front here. You don't get to see this as common, intuitive, observable as on the Earth. And so when we go into a frontier, our normal earth going intuition no longer applies. So this, this, Cool. Works amazing. And instead of putting a puff of air on it, I'm going to put a puff of water. 
This is going to have a lot more momentum in it than the air. Whoa, whoa. I was afraid. Oh, look at that. Cool. I squirted water through. Oh, isn't that cool? The water and the skier went around the air cavity and pulled the huge bubble. Wow. Oh, that is so cool. Number three, European astronaut Tim Peake tests how the body responds to being dizzy in space. And does it make me feel unwell? I'm going to get Tim to spin me around uh, doing something that will probably make me feel quite sick down on Earth. So let's see how that goes. This could be the worst, worst idea I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'll just go into a ball and start spinning. How many times? Yeah, yeah, on axis, that's cool. Actually, it's more provocative when you go off axis. Yeah, no, don't worry. Provocative is fine. Keep it going. Uh, yeah. Let's go for it. That's good. Okay, I'll see if I can. I'm feeling dizzy. I'll see how quickly it stops. So it definitely felt dizzy initially, and now it's gone. No, it's yeah, quick. yeah, completely normal. Amazing. Yeah, and again, I wouldn't be able to kind of just get off the fairground ride spinning that quickly for so long. I feel normal. Yeah. Crazy. It is amazing. Number two, students from Nova Scotia ask Chris Hatfield to wring out water from a cloth. The results are unexpectedly quite interesting. We might have the coolest washcloths ever here at the space station. I'm going to show you. Here's one of our washcloths. And it's packed. It's put down into this little tiny hockey puck so that uh, it saves some space. But when you open up a hockey puck, so when you open up your hockey puck and turn it into a washcloth, it was compressed in a great big vice. Okay, so here's my washcloth, like a magic trick. And now I'm gonna get this soaking wet, and then we're gonna see what'll happen when we wring it out. Merritt and Kendra suggested that I dip this in a bag, but bags don't hold water in space, so instead I filled a water bag. This has drinking water in it. And I'm going to uh, squirt a bunch of water into this washcloth. Okay, so here's a soaking wet washcloth. Get the microphone so you can hear me while I'm talking. And now let's let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. So the experiment worked beautifully. And the answer to the question is, the water squeezes out of the cloth. And then because of the surface tension of the water, it, um, it actually runs along the surface of the cloth and then up into my hand, almost like you had jello on your hands or gel on your hand. And it'll just stay there. Wonderful moisturizer in my hands. And the cloth doesn't really unravel itself. It just stays there floating like a, uh, like a dog's chew toy, soaking wet. Great experiment, worked perfectly. Meredith and Kendra, congratulations, great idea.
Number one, U.S. astronaut Scott Kelly tests how various dyes interact with a floating ball of water. It's almost like he's creating a miniature planet. subscribe for more top five videos and if you enjoyed this video you might enjoy my previous upload on the top five amazing spacewalks let's talk about space food in the early days of space exploration food was mostly squeezed out of tubes and brought up in dehydrated packets Today, we can have quite a variety of food. There's all sorts of things that we normally consume on Earth that we have here in space. We just need some minor adaptations. In the case of uh, sandwiches, we had to substitute for bread. So we decided to use tortillas. But why? Mostly it's because bread, of course, makes crumbs. When you eat them on Earth, the crumbs fall down to the ground. But here, crumbs are just going to float away. On the other hand, the tortillas that we use are heat-treated and specially packaged in an oxygen-free environment to prevent mold from growing. They're packed in packages like this. And thanks to that process, a tortilla like this can be good for 18 months. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up our tortilla. We're going to get our peanut butter, squirt it onto the tortilla, get our honey, squirt that on there, and we will have peanut butter honey sandwich in space. Open up the tortilla, and voila, a weightless tortilla. Okay, we got one tortilla. No, run away. Take my uh, peanut butter, open it up. Mm, can't rip it. Fortunately, we have space scissors. We're gonna attach my tether so they don't go floating out. Take the scissors, cut open the peanut butter bunch. The peanut butter is open, squeeze it onto the tortilla carefully. And now a little honey. Hey, I noticed something cool about the honey. Instead of the bubble sitting at the top, because there's no gravity to make it float up, the bubble is floating in the middle. It all closed up, and the envelope of peanut butter honey is ready to eat. Hmm. Not too bad. Last piece of my sandwich. It's been pretty delicious. Well, my hands are all sticky. Got to clean up. We don't have a sink. We don't have running water. You've got to wash yourself up some other disinfectant wipes. All cleaned up, nice and hygienic on the space station. This goes in the trash. Lunch is over. Delicious.
good afternoon sir we are medical students from ps yes sir we are very eager sir here good afternoon sir we are very happy to see you sir what is the question sir what is the role of a medical student in building a strong nation what is your opinion well healthy people build a healthy nation okay summer okay. okay so but doctors but doctors i want to ask you how many hearts you have Eh? One heart. You have got only one heart. That is biological heart. But you must have another heart. What is that heart? Kind heart. All doctors should have kind heart and biological heart. Okay. Thank you, Irvin. Things in space look a whole lot cooler than here on Earth. Welcome back, guys. to become the first citizen of the country and you know to be the supreme commander of the armed forces uh, i think uh, isse acha success story i don't think india mein uh, aur koi hai
ஒரே ஒரு நிமிஷம் வரும் our biggest driver is to create benefits to society the scientific community and the country at large we do not rest on past laurel we constantly look at the future and seek new challenges in everything we do a lot of hard work goes into conceiving planning and executing the program in collaboration with various industries industry partnership has been a hallmark of isro since its inception and we hope to continue building strong mutually beneficial relationship with every step we take forward ஏற்கனவே ஒரு மீட்டிங் ஆன்ல இருக்கும்போது இது ஆன் ஆகுமாப்பா இங்க மியூட்ல தான் இருக்கு எல்லாத்தையும் மியூட்ல போட்டு தான் வந்துட்டா அதுல